So I'm very happy to welcome you all to this event today organized by Current Supernode, the KU Leufe, and the University of Strathclyde, and also to the several hundred people uh, joining online today. So as the Secretary General of Current, uh, my name is Leila Sawyer. I'd just like to say a few words about Current. Uh, we're an association of uh, innovative grid technology companies uh, taking Europe's electricity grids to the next level. Um, both technologies that can be implemented very, very quickly to help get more out of the existing grid and new and innovative technologies uh, that can help build the grids that we will need to support uh, a fully decarbonized Europe. So I'm very proud to be part of this uh, event today. Uh, I think just in the past year, we've reached a turning point where we're no longer uh, banging on about how, why grids are so important, uh, but we can actually start talking about how to solve this, this daunting challenge and how to actually build a grid that can decarbonize Europe. Um, up until now, uh, we've been uh, inching forward, making incremental improvements uh, as we go along. Um, but that is just not going to cut it with the task uh, that we have uh, ahead of us. Um, we need to look at what we're going to need in 2050 uh, and what the technology gaps are and what we actually need to do to get there. And that's what we're going to do today uh, in the course of this event. So there's a famous uh, Einstein quote that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. Uh, so if we want something differently, a different outcome for Europe, we're, we are going to have to do something differently. And that's what the speakers today are going to talk to us about. So first up, we have John Fitzgerald, CEO of Supernode, who's going to tell us uh, what a 2050 grid model could look like when you break free from ingrained uh, and damaging assumptions. Then we will have a Dick van Hertem professor at the KU Leuven, who's going to give an overview of the current technologies that are available and whether current technologies can deliver what we are going to need. Probably as a spoiler alert, uh, there are going to be new technologies needed. Uh, then we will have Professor Lee from the University of Strathclyde who will present to us a study that demonstrates the first feasible approach to a meshed DC overlay grid covering the continent of, of Europe. Uh, then we'll have uh, Owen Hodge talking about whether superconductors can fill that technology gap. And then after the, the coffee break, we'll have uh, Anche Ort from Energinet and convener of the uh, NSUI's offshore network development plans, uh, and Eric Lecomte from the commission, from DGNR talking about grids and uh, DC technologies. So we do have a Slido uh, link for if, there are, for if there are questions, also for the people uh, online. Um, and after each presentation, we will, uh, if time permits, allow for one or two questions. So uh, get your questions uh, ready because uh, otherwise it'll be too late. Um, so now I'd like to welcome to the stage, uh, John Fitzgerald, CEO of Supernode since its inception in 2018, developing next uh, generation superconducting transmission technologies. And before this, he was the director of grid development interconnection with AirGrid. So. Okay, so good morning everyone um, and all of you tuning in, delighted to be here, um, fabulous venue, uh, thank you Leila. Um, so I'm going to talk about a grid to decarbonize Europe and um, firstly I'm going to talk about two uh, irrefutable facts. Uh, I'm going to use some, some, some acronyms, uh, some analogies, there's going to be heroes and villains and of course a crisis and some view of a solution. Uh, I think that's where we're at. Uh, my first job was an engineer, was in the control center, keeping the lights on. And every day I just worried about what could possibly go wrong. And I knew that success was nothing. So if things went wrong, the politicians would call my bosses and they'd look for why was the hospital without electricity? Why, why was there a problem? And the worst thing that could happen was a blackout. So that framed everything. So we were like the watcher on the wall in the National Control Center, keeping the darkness away. And that worked and it's worked incredibly well and it's a thankless role because if things go well, nothing said. If things go wrong, you're the villain. And the people who will call you the villain are the politicians. 
representing us, the people who want the power. So that's why this is really important, because it's unseen, it's really important. For 100 years, we've made this model better and better. It's become more complex. And in Europe, we have the largest power system in the world, and it runs incredibly well. Unfortunately, it only runs on carbon, and we have a climate crisis. So the same politicians who will make that phone call are now setting hugely ambitious targets because we asked them to. These targets are incredibly large. So there's a game changer. So things have been simple, and now climate renewables, they've changed the game. The good news is we have electrification, which is the most efficient way to decarbonize. And we have incredible generation technology that is good enough. We can do wind and solar at scale and pace. The big challenge is that the energy system in the background, the grid that supports that, the power system, it's going to have to move from 25% to 75% plus. So it's going to have to take on a lot of the running and energy. And the grid that enables that has been developing very slowly and incrementally. So it's the biggest challenge. We have uh, finance, there are some wobbles, but the biggest challenge we have is grid. Now, it's easy not being the watcher on the wall to say, just do it. Just uh, the renewables are keen. Everybody wants to do it. Just do it. I think it's hard when you're responsible like that, the DSOs and the TSOs, to just make the leap and the jump. So these are not QR codes. This is a, a maze, and we are halfway there, maybe 10% there. We've done the easy bit. We've gotten rid of some of our renewable, of some of our fossil fuels, um, but there are a number of ways to go. And failure is is getting part way there. So 2030 success does not mean 2050 success. Decarbonization is the goal, and sometimes it's useful just to step back from the current challenges and targets. And I don't have a license to keep the lights on anymore, so I can do that. So we're asking some questions. And last year, UCD did a study where they looked at 2019 data weather data, 2050 demand data from the 1.5 tech scenario. And they worked out that it'll be 40% cheaper to serve energy to customers right across Europe if we have more grids. It's easy to say it, but that was just corridors, major flows between countries. It's not the same as a grid. A grid is something that can have contingencies that is individual components. So what we tried to do was to do a study to answer some questions that are really important. What does a system without carbon look like? We don't have the, the coal, the oil, and the gas in our cities anymore. The renewables are remote, the best of them. What kind of a grid do we need? How big does it need to be? What's the optimal circuit size within those corridors? So it's easy to say we need a 30 gigawatt corridor from the North Sea to Belgium, but what are the circuit sizes in that? What's appropriate? And then we can answer the question, is the technology we have today adequate? So this is an input that should be complementary to the work that's being done by the agencies. Um, so it's, it's food for thought. I think it's important. It's technology agnostic. So we're not going to be constrained by what we have today. This is, if you have all the energy targets we've set ourselves to decarbonize and you do a grid based on renewables, what does it look like? How big should it be? So we, we got some modelers, um, some computer modelers um, from UCD. Um, and we asked, set up a model for us and make this proof study that shows a 40% decrease, make it a network and tell us what it looks like. So the setup and assumptions, it's technology agnostic. There are a number of nodes. Each node is limited, is connected by at least two power corridors. The first acronym, largest single infeed, three gigawatts is what the system can withstand the loss of. So we put that into the model, but you can change that two gigawatts for Scandinavia. You can change it up or down depending upon. We limited the max circuit size to 12 gigawatts. That's enormous. The largest circuit in the world is 12 gigawatts. We thought that's probably as much as we need. Um, in a contingency event, the circuits within each corridor. So the corridor is made up of circuits and they can, they can offer additional overload capacity just like the mesh grids do today. This grid is meshed. An existing transfer capacity that exists. So in France, per se, there might be six nodes. And today there is connectivity between those nodes. Obviously, there's a national grid there, a strong grid. That's not factored in this. So some of the capacity called for between nodes within country may be overstated internationally to a lesser extent. And obviously in the marine, there's not much grid at all. So that won't be overstated. 
the model assumes no interconnection with Asia or Africa. So we get no help to keep the lights on with our renewable system from, from outside. So this is Europe. So I, I would say these assumptions can change. And the model is called the relay network model. I'm not sure if it's 2050 or 2060, that's to be decided, but this is where we get to in a decarbonized scenario. The solar, does it, there's 1.1 terawatts of solar, 740 gigawatts of offshore, 450. Rooftop solar is not modeled in this. Um, there's, there's more there. There's, importantly, there's about 100 nodes all over Europe and about 200 power corridors. So what you see here is heuristic, it's power corridors, and it's connecting up the targets where we think they'll be. Um, the methodology is the first thing we do is make sure there's enough juice. So if you look on the right-hand side, you'll see the red nodes are importers, green nodes are exporters. So the green nodes in this sample are in the North Sea and in the Marine, the Baltic Sea, and the rest of Europe is taking the energy. So the first thing was to make sure that even without a grid, there was enough juice to keep the lights on 24 seven. Um, then it was to do an algorithm, um, a max flow algorithm to size the corridors to ensure the network 95% of the time delivered the network. That's an input again, it can change to 99 or to 90. We identified each of these nodes as geographical coordinates where the energy comes from. So you can identify the eight most demanding hours for grid transfers. So that will be when there's a storm coming in from the west, passing over, over Europe, west to east, or when there's solar in the south, and we're heavily reliant. So this will put the most uh, pressure on the grid. So we picked the eight most demanding hours using 2019 weather data. You can use any year. We conduct a contingency analysis for those eight hours, because when the network is stressed, that's when you need it to stand up for the most onerous situation. And we gradually reduce the circuit sizes from the size of the corridor to the circuit size that would maintain security of supply at all times. And that was really the objective of this, this exercise. So here's an example of an individual uh, corridor with a contingency on it. So the corridor in question is Bulgaria to Romania too. These are not actual nodes. This is, this is a, a, a grid, a technology agnostic grid. And you can see in this that the power is traveling from the Mediterranean north to the demand center. So the power is trying to get north and after the event, there's a hit and we lose six gigawatts. Um, we lose six gigawatts, something popping up my screen here. Gone. Uh, we lose um, 7.5 gigawatts is lost and the stability criterion is breached. 4.2 gigawatts is too much power to lose across the network. So it's not acceptable, the circuit's too big. So we keep going down. So it started at 30 and we keep going down until we get an acceptable outcome. When we get to six gigawatts, when we lose six gigawatts, so you can see the X, it's just, it's hit here. Um, between Bulgaria and Romania too, we lose um, six gigawatts, but the other circuits have overload capacity at 10%, so they pick it up. And the outcome is, um, yeah, the outcome is 2.6 gigawatts of loss. So that's acceptable, it meets the criterion, which is, a, which is an input to the model. We do this across, uh, all, all the circuits, but for this particular hour, we go down to six gigawatts and it's satisfactory. So obviously 30 gigawatts is too big. We do this right across the network. So for, for the 200 corridors and the 100 nodes, this is done. And we come up with all corridors across all demand hours and we limit the max circuit size to 12 gigawatts. And the average circuit size, that the largest average circuit size that can maintain stability is six gigawatts. Now, why would you want the largest? Well, because each circuit costs money. It needs consent, uh, it needs a footprint, it needs a landfall, it needs a right of way. So here's an example of, of a 12 gigawatt corridor between Romania and Hungary. It's 262 kilometers apart, it's 12 gigawatts. So that's 3,143 gigawatt kilometers. So you can do that with two gigawatt technology, which we have today, and you'll end up with 1,572 circuit kilometers that might be cables most likely it'll be cables but they'll all need a footprint and that'll take materials resources consent money if you do it with larger technology you considerably reduce the amount of resources the amount of footprint that's required and that's that's really what this study tried to show 
and you can see reduced footprint. So there's some graphics there, and this is replicated right across. So effectively, if you have to do a large amount of gigawatt kilometers, if you do it with big, bigger circuits, you can do it much cheaper. So the conclusion of this um, is that the average circuit size of six gigawatt minimizes circuit kilometers and satisfies the N minus one stability criteria. We need circa 2 billion gigawatt kilometers of transfer capacity to keep the lights on. If you change the model, you'll change that number. You can change the node size, you can change the, the geographic location, you can add interconnection, which will reduce storage costs somewhat. You can change a number of things, but what you won't change is the conclusion that we need much bigger uh, circuit technology size than we have today, because two gigawatts is the limit of underground cable technology today, maybe 2.5. This is calling for much bigger circuits. Six gigawatts is the average, but in some instances, much bigger circuits are capable of maintaining stability. The cost and quantum of materials for infrastructure can be reduced, but also the permitting. Um, and these are the targets we set ourselves. So this isn't being driven by targets that, that I've dreamt up. These are the targets that the, the commission and the member states of Europe have set for themselves. And, and the overriding conclusion is there's a gap between what we have and what we need in transmission, so we've work to do. Now, this is a bit of thought leadership that's complementary to the work that's being done uh, on the offshore network development plan. I would say the watchers on the wall need all our support to keep the lights on and to do the innovation because they don't get thanked when the lights go out. So that's ever present. So this is gonna be a huge gargantuan challenge. And the key to it is innovation and new technology that can be delivered and to, to spend the time now and invest, this is important. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, John, and for sticking to the time limit. Do we have any, any questions from, uh, from the audience at this point? And who, who is manning the iPad for the questions? Okay, so no questions okay. yet online, so that's great. Um, so the so the I, the question I have so the average size is uh, for in the outcome the average size would be uh, six gigawatt circuit breakers. Mm -hmm. So is it the the bigger the better? Yeah, well, not necessarily. Um, some of the circuits will be two gigawatts and some will be twelve because we limited it at twelve. Um, I think it's about right away and it's about time and it's about material and the amount of copper and the amount of consent and, it, and literally the quantum. So gigawatt kilometers are a proxy for cost. Um, so this isn't a cost model. It doesn't say it's going to be cheaper if you do six versus seven, it's cheap. But the circuit kilometers are what you have to build. You have to procure the right away. You have to procure the landfall. You have to find a place to, to bring your cable. If we're bringing this much power uh, from the North Sea and from other areas, you, you literally, the targets are so big, you need a, a grid that's commensurate with that. And we no longer have oil, oil, coal and gas stations in our cities operating in this model. So we can't just flick on the coal machine when the wind doesn't blow. This is keeping the lights on with renewables, a weather-based system. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you. Any other, any final questions from the audience? Okay, then I would like to, thank you, John. Then I would like to introduce uh, Dirk van Hertem, a professor at the University of uh, Leuven, and with many other qualifications uh, that he has given me permission to skip because he will already be uh, speaking uh, for too long. <laughs> so well, I'll do my best, you, best not to speak too long. Um, so. Yes. I'll start already talking uh, a little bit. So um, uh, earlier uh, I was introduced that I would say an overview of all the technologies that we are and whether we are there to, to build the grid. I will talk about the available technologies, but as was mentioned earlier, you cannot choose and the amount of innovation is still necessary. As a professor, it's also very difficult to say that there is no more innovation necessary. So clearly the results will be that a lot of innovation is necessary, but at the same time, already a lot is there um, and what i would like to use this presentation for is to show that the um, the the steps that we need to take are of a different scale than what we are used to do. so i would like to reinforce a previous story 
a little bit. I will not speak on specific values, but on uh, kind of the direction. Okay, and just to put some numbers here, this is some, some outcomes. So my apologies for the Dutch, but this is just the energy, the electric, electricity production in Belgium estimated for 2050. What you can see is basically roughly, we go from somewhere 100 to 200 plus. Um, wh why is that? Why do you expect that the electricity consumption will, will increase? Well, actually we need to think about the primary energy use and today, the electric power sector is just 20, 25% of the total energy consumption, that the entire primary energy and the rest is fossils, largely. Uh, so uh, for heating, for industry, et cetera, that the entire sector needs to be transferred into uh, something carbon free. And the best way to do it is electrification, which means we'll consume more. It will be more efficient. So we'll have in an ideal world, less primary energy use, but it will be more electrical. So electrical energy use times two to three might be that we need some wires for that. Yeah. Second thing is we have very ambitious targets and this is just some examples. Um, uh, here in Ashburg, they said, okay, we're going to have 150 gigawatt by 2050 by just four countries in the North Sea, uh, Belgium, Netherlands, uh, Germany, and Denmark. Uh, a few months later, they put on the numbers a little bit more, added some hundreds of gigawatts, uh, very ambitious targets, they're all offshore. Currently, there are not a lot of grids offshore, so clearly you might need to have some wires to connect those as well. And I'll, I'll go a little bit more on this slide. You might have seen before I've given some presentations earlier, um, but these targets that we have are mind boggling. They're, we talk about hundreds of gigawatts as if this is normal, but the continental European power system has kind of a, of a peak load somewhere in the four, 500, 600 gigawatt range. And we're just going to put three, four, 500 gigawatt offshore. Uh, this is not normal business. Uh, and I'll show that in a little bit more in detail. So let's say that we focus here on the North Sea, which is just 200 gigawatts. Uh, this is a wind Europe map. Um, and let's say that we have five gigawatt links. Uh, why 500? Because that's a five gigawatt, that's 200 divided by five was easy to draw, but they don't exist. Uh, we don't have five gigawatt cables today. Uh, but you need this kind of spaghetti. And if we look at the Baltic, you add some extra lines. Note that, that for the Baltic I've drawn, uh, this is by the way, uh, PowerPoint magic. This is no calculation behind it. Uh, just uh, 200 gigawatt divided by five gives so many lines. Um, but this PowerPoint magic, yeah, you need to put the wire somewhere. Uh, there are four in the Baltic states, which currently have roughly 4 million inhabitants. Uh, do you think that they will have 20 gigawatts of load? Uh, so will that be connected to something else? Mm. We need to have a DC grid that connects all these lines as we did with the AC system. And then of course we need to bring it inland as well. Uh, we need to go to the load centers or we need to move the people or the industries, uh, something to think about. Um, it's going to be very expensive. European commission thinks uh, with, a, with a low number of just 300 uh, gigawatt, they thought it's going to be roughly um, 800 billion euros also before inflation. So safe to say that it's going to be rather expensive. Uh, two thirds of that for the grid, that two thirds is roughly the GDP of Belgium that we need to invest by 2050. So in the next 26 years. Yeah. So why a DC grid as one of the technologies that is the most likely contender to solve all our problems? Uh, it would connect multiple HVDC lines, eh? not line by line, but making also at the DC side connections. Could be as a multi-terminal, could have some redundant paths, like here at the bottom. Um, and the reason for that would be that you have less converters that you would need. They are very expensive, lossy, and, uh, and complicated. So if you have fewer, that would be good. But at the same time, that would mean that we have uh, DC side nodes and non-controlled DC flows it will be a little bit more complicated. To what extent we need a DC grid? I think this was just mentioned before as well. Well, we don't really know whether we will design it in the same way that we designed the AC power system. Will we have an N-1 secure DC grid on top of an existing AC grid? Um, maybe not. Something that is a design criteria, yeah? Okay. By the way, I, I added this slide because I, I always got the comment that I was talking too much about offshore and that this is where the DC grid was coming. But actually from the South, we have very similar 
uh, action. So this is just a plan for the hypergrid that uh, Terna is planning to build in Italy. Just in Italy, they're going to build uh, a, a DC grid. It will be multi-terminal in stages, but afterwards it should connect to the rest as well. So just saying that this is not just an offshore story. And what was mentioned as well, we are not the only ones. Finally, as a power system engineer, I'm very happy to say that the literature, which is not IEEE transactions, are saying that we need more grids. And so this guy from The Economist, they mentioned hug pylons, not trees. And so I think that's a nice one. I do think they need to be underground, but uh, that's a detail. Um, and the same for the Financial Times and uh, the Biden and Clean Act means more lines. And the same from the... Uh, IEA. So, yeah, okay, everyone agrees we need more grids. Now, you might say, okay, this is going to be expensive. Is there value for money? And I, I didn't use the UCD uh, figures, but just three other sources. Um, and so he said in their 10-year network development plan that for every 1.3 billion that you invest, you get roughly 4 billion per year return on investment. Well, so, okay, social welfare increases by 4 billion, by an investment of 1.3 per year. So factor roughly three. The same was, same, roughly the same conclusions came from this um, study in the US on their macro grid solution. Also there, 350 billion return 1 trillion. So I think the ratio is important. The numbers clearly are wrong because all these numbers are, are based on thousands of assumptions as we know if we do studies. But the ratio, I think, is, is consistent and, and uh, yeah, two to three times in, in return. So why do we get DC grids in the end? And what is the roadmap for that? First, there is a push for offshore, where today we're looking at multi-terminal connections. Already today, we're looking at connections to the UK, which is stop on the energy island in Belgium. There are others as well. Next step is offshore energy hubs. We have a small one in Belgium. We'll be the first one in Belgium with an energy island, but it's not yet fully a DC energy island in Bornholm and in uh, well, the second one in Denmark are planned. And the next step will be that we'll have mesh offshore grids with inland connections like tentacles inside the grid. And by 2045, we expect an EU-wide interconnection. And th this roadmap is, is aligned with the SAP plan as well with, with our own research. But I also would like to emphasize on the second push, and that is for undergrounding. Except for me, I haven't met too many people that say overhead transmission lines are beautiful. I like pylons. That's not really a common thing to say. And many people say, actually, we should put things underground. So today, I would say that we're doing underground when needed. Already, and in Germany, I think we're already there, underground when possible, even at the 400 kV or higher level. And at what point in time we will have the uh, policy that says underground, period. Huh? Because if it's possible, it would open doors. So I think those are the two pushes that we can see. So I, I now have a number of challenges which I see ahead because of course DC grids are fantastic and we believe that this is going to be the solution and whatever, but is it going to be easy to, to have that? And, and I'll start with my back of the envelope uh, calculation. I, I promise to do that. And there are two sides of it. On the left-hand side, I, I said I just made a rough calculation. The numbers are a bit dated before supply chain issues, etc. cetera, but uh, 400 gigawatt, let's say two gigawatt wind farms, the, the, the grid for that would cost roughly 150 billion. And if you assume just 150 to 200 kilometers of cable in a mesh grid, another roughly 150 billion. So let's say roughly 300 billion transmission grid cost. And that's kind of consistent with the other numbers uh, there. And then I think it's important to say that these big numbers actually don't say anything because we don't really grasp this kind of sizes. So let's say, what if we would have started 1st of January this year in actually implementing that? And what does it cost per year? Or what does it mean per year? So that means that we install 15 gigawatt of offshore wind per year from today till 2050. There is roughly 30 gigawatt installed uh, in Europe. Uh, so that means half of what we have today 
per year extra. Two gigawatt wind farms, that means 15 converter stations per year for the offshore alone. That is about the same as what is globally produced today on top of what we do today. Yeah? Um, roughly 2,300 kilometers of, let's say, 525 kV, which is the today's standard uh, subsea cable per year, which means eight extruders extra, because you can basically make a kilometer a day. Ballpark figures. But also 10 to 12 billion per year, per year of which the North Sea TSOs have an annual turnover of roughly 20, a little bit less than 20. So that means that these good house father stocks uh, that the TSOs are need to invest in new technology for half of their annual turnover for the next 27 years. It's going to be interesting to see how that actually is done in a regulated environment. So something to, to consider. This is not trivial. If you go to the CFO of these companies, they are worried about these things. Okay, uh, then this is something, This, my apologies, this is a Flemish slide. Um, we have a very famous project, which is called Ventilus, which is a 60 kilometer transmission line next to the highway, largely, six gigawatt AC, probably. Well, this is basically what is proposed. So this is, this map shows how many of these Ventilus, we call them Ventili, which is, uh, the Latin for multiple of Ventilus, um, uh, that you would need by 2040. If you put offshore here and expect that it goes onshore. So each of these red lines are neighborhood committee meetings, uh, discussions, environmental impact assessments, et cetera, et cetera. And this is six gigawatt. This is sizable, sizable installations. Are we really going to do each of them separately? Or do we need to think about something more consistently like a master plan for Europe? Huh? Thinking about 50 gigawatt between Antwerp and the Ruhr area, and from the Ruhr area to Munich, another 50 gigawatt or something like that. Already thinking about the corridors, and then which kind of technologies would fit that? Huh? How many football fields wide of energy corridors do we have? Like seven or eight corridors, uh, football fields wide. You should think about it today, because if you wait until 2040, I'm quite sure that you don't find those seven football fields. Another thing, which is, I would say, top of mind of, let's say, the technicians amongst us is interoperability. Uh, I will not go too much into detail, but HVDC is great. It has very fancy, beautiful converters that very quickly can react to any kind of signal. However, because they react very quickly, they can also start to oscillate against each other. Okay, that's pretty annoying because that leads to blackouts. Not most of the time, but sometimes. And of course, the grid needs to be on always. So we cannot have any system that might, in some operating point, work very badly. So what we do today, we actually buy an additional part of the converter, let's say the controls, separately. We connect it to a fancy computer, and then we buy the other side as well. So we have two of these uh, uh, converter uh, controllers, and we connect them to a computer to see whether they, in reality, would interact badly or not. We tune them. It takes quite a bit of time. And then we say, OK, this works well, and we go on. Now, this is a system that doesn't work. It doesn't scale. And I will show this with a very simple example. Let's say that you have vendor A and vendor B for first link, and then a new vendor comes in. So first, you need to investigate all the possible interactions between those two. But now you need to investigate all these connections between three. And then you have a new link that might be integrated. All these possible interconnections calls all, let's say, expert engineering time to go. And at some point in time, there might be new vendors coming up. You might have a new edition of a software. And each time you do that, you need to do the full screening again. It's not really plug and play today. So this is a solution that we can't have. For that, and I'm not going into detail, we think that a more open control a paradigm is more suited. The next thing that we need to think about is, okay, how are we going to design the system? So today, continental Europe can expect uh, up to three gigawatt of loss of load at a single point in time. And now, John just said, okay, we're going to have six gigawatt lines. So what if you lose six gigawatts? Yeah, do you then lose the entire European system? Because you cannot design a system that will never have a failure. 
okay, we might think that we redesign our requirements a little bit, that three gigawatt might not be secret, sacred. And already today, I think in, in, in Ireland also, uh, three gigawatt would also be a bit too much. Uh, so if you would connect to Ireland, you need to think about what we do. We might have some short-term requirements that are different. That means that we need to change our requirement. We might think about how we protect our system. If we are quicker, we might actually lose less for a shorter period of time. And we might need to think about how we design our reserves. And what we found out is that there is an optimum and uh, there is a reason to go for bigger, uh, there is a possibility to go for bigger connections, but they require to have more advanced protection. So there is an interaction between that. And that's a design criteria that you need to think of early enough because if you don't, then you're stuck with a particular setup. Uh, the next back, back thing, I, I said I mentioned some, um, some issues. Energy hubs or energy islands, they're great. I mean, apparently there could be some palm trees. I don't know for sure, but uh, in any case, there are going to be places where lots of converters end up at a single spot. Again, these are very beautiful devices that are quickly reacting. And on that island, there is no inertia. Um, and any unbalance in power will need to be met immediately. Very interesting from a control perspective, very interesting from an operational perspective, but it's not yet certain how that will work in all possible uh, situations. So yes, we will have that, but well, still some work to be done. Uh, I have some, some possible issues that we need to think about. I'll, I'll, I'll not go into detail today. Another thing that we need to think about is I'm advocating that we'll have a system which will be an HVDC supergrid overlaying the pan-European power system. Wonderful. And we will import hundreds of gigawatts from where the wind blows at the moment that is in Scotland. It's great. And then we have solar from the south. But that also will mean that we are very dependent on that, on, for, for instance, the weather system. So will we be able to operate our system in the same way as we do today? Are we willing to risk our reserves and our energy coming from Scotland, given that if there is a catastrophic failure somewhere in the middle, that we would be affected as well? So how are we resilient against any big changes in the system? Operationally, this will make quite a bit of a difference. So we think that we'll end up in kind of a grid of grid system where we'll have a traffic light system, taking into account, for instance, the storm in Scotland, kind of making a firewall around it. I have nothing against Scotland. This is just an example where I expect there is lots of, uh, of wind. So just as an example. Huh? So we put a firewall on that and uh, make sure that we have all green lights where here there would be some, some more red lights. How it exactly will work, we don't know yet, but we, we do think it will happen. And as an engineer, this slide is maybe the one that concerns me or as a researcher, uh, most is as close to our own heart because we're developing significant, uh, uh, we're putting significant focus on that. Are we able to calculate the future power system with today's software? Uh, and my answer is no. Our power flow and security constraint OPF models lack any detailed software models for HVDC. Grid development software for hybrid AC-DC systems is not available. Um, always custom-made solutions. Cost-benefit analysis don't accurately account for the details of how this works. Market models typically are lacking. The average model software, kind of diesel and power factory, PSSE, uh, the, the converters are okay modeled for some studies, but not for all. Uh, very limited DC grid models, EMT models, lack any accurate open models and are extremely time consuming if you want to get anything done. And for real-time simulations, it's even more expensive and time consuming. And also there, good models are lacking. Closing to the end, I don't know how many minutes I still have. You have a few minutes. Oh, okay, you can, good. You can finish this slide. No, no I will finish my, uh, so. What, what we need to think about also is how we organize our system. I mentioned that we would move to a more uh, controllable system. At today, we manage the system by different independent system operators that have their own view. Um, but if we move to more 
controllable injections, more renewables, more vulnerability, that will mean that we have higher security margins. And that will come at a significant cost. Sometimes people say we should have one TSO to rule them all, a super TSO. That doesn't sound very appealing to system operators. And maybe it's not necessary, but we do think we need to have a more dynamic system operation with shared responsibilities. We call that a grid of grids. And I think that's uh, something that is um, coming up very quickly as well. This is my, oh, I would like to say, this is the real question that you asked me. Is HVDC or the technology ready to start building HVDC grids? And my answer is yes, of course it is. We are ready to start. But then the second word is equally important, but today's technology is not perfect. It's not great. It has interoperability protection issues. Ratings are not yet there where they have to be. And today's technology can be improved. It's not because it exists that you want to use it. So we do want to use, but we want to use it even more. We need to work on efficiency. Might mean new power uh, semiconductor materials, new converted topologies. We need to work on our ratings. I should have put 12 here, uh, but we need to think about our corridors. We need to work on standardization. We want to have modular open controls, new software models. We might have new applications that we ha don't have today. Do we have floating HVDC converters, uh, submerged HVDC converters? What about our sensors? systems integration. Supply chain today is a big issue, and that's because every, a lot of experts are necessary and a lot of um, slow work is there. We need to work more towards automated process and modularity and costs. Yeah, it's really expensive. It shouldn't be. It should be cheaper. But yeah, OK, where we are. With this slide, I'm going to really end. And, and this is also what we, we discussed within the SAP plan. Let's say that we have a need at some point in time, six gigawatt cables in the near future. I don't know when that is. But that needs that we need to think about demonstrating that before that, and we need to develop it earlier. At this point in time, we focus a lot on what is not here. But And if it's not here, we're not doing it. We need to actually make sure that we have the full chain there. And that's for all our different technologies that we plan to have in the future. And this kind of a roadmap is really important for us to make sure that this actually happens and we need to work on that immediately. So yes, HVDC is possible. Yes, we need to do research. And it's not because we don't know exactly how the future will look like today that we shouldn't start building it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dirk. A lot of uh, challenges and uh, concerns uh, on your slides. Um, are there any questions from the audience? Yes, Sebastian, uh, I'll walk towards you, Sebastian. Um, well, Sebastian P from uh, Crescent. I have many, many questions, uh, but just one uh, remark. Uh, DC is all the more complex, costly, whatever that we want it to be uh, exactly as our AC grids. And we should not make DC grids uh, just uh, changing the A by a D. Uh, we already have AC grids. So if we have uh, DC equipments, DC grids even on top of it, do we really need to have a mesh grid, a mesh DC grid, or would it not be many equipments, maybe uh, working in islands? Would you need N minus one? If actually, if it is just taking some uh, wind power from the North Sea, so if you lose some uh, some node there, well, it's just generation. It's not a hospital. That's a bit different. Yeah, but it could also be England. But, uh, yeah, no, no, no I, I'm not saying it's everywhere, but we, we can still have some hierarchy in the in the design and oh, yeah. try to find some, uh, to, to release some constraints somehow to, to read them in order to make it happen. And in terms of cost, I also wonder whether, well, is actually undergrounding desirable and desired by the population? I really mean it. I will leave it as a teaser. Everybody who wants to discuss it, uh, we can do it at the break. But definitely in terms of conclusion, yes, the design, if we want to make the grid as uh, superb as the AC grid is, we may not achieve it. If we can, by design, find some rules that make it a little bit easier to achieve, 
uh, we may have something that is actually very much uh, efficient, but much uh, easier to achieve and less costly. Well, I, I, I'll try to answer within 20 minutes. <laughs> no, I, I'll keep it short. Um, first of all, I don't think that N minus one is a good rule. Um, it's a good rule to start with, uh, and it was easy to explain and, and whatever, and it worked reasonably well. But I do not think that this is the most appropriate uh, overall, uh, because we need to go to a more risk-based probabilistic approach. Um, and in the same way, I, I don't, I haven't advocated that N minus one for offshore is the solution, and definitely everywhere. But I do think that redundancy is valuable, and uh, I I don't think that there is an easy solution for some of the parts of the DC grid which I propose, so like an offshore grid. There is no. Uh, AC solution, so DC will be the solution. Whether you then mesh it or not, and how much equipment you need, that's a cost-benefit analysis that you need to do. And in AC, it seemed that meshing was actually valuable. Always, well, there are also some uh, dedicated single lines, and uh, there are also places which are not N minus one, but N minus two or more, uh, depending on the required reliability. So I think that's that part of that. That's that's my one minute answer to this 20 minute uh, answer requirement. Yeah. Um, any other questions uh, from the audience? I thought I saw one. But I uh, also have a question. Uh, so you showed also some roadmaps. Uh, would you say that everyone agrees on that this is the direction where we are heading or is that still a big discussion that you find yourself having? Um, I, I think everyone agrees that there will be more grids and more DC, whether everyone believes that there will be a super grid, I think that's discussed. Um, uh, we'll see how far we get. And maybe it's also not the dates is also something that is always quite uh, challenging. Yeah, but, uh, we hope that by 2050, we'll have a decarbonized Europe. Uh, if it's 2060, I think we still will have a good job done. I mean, it's still a lot of work and it's still, still, still a lot of work. Um, yeah, so just to have a question from the online, um, sorry, I'll walk towards you. Uh, so one question from, uh, yeah, Mark Norton online. Uh, many spokespeople for HVDC have said that HVDC production to 2030 is already fully committed. Resources are insufficient before and after. What alternative and complementary technologies to HVDC are we going to onboard before 2030 and to diversify HVDC plans thereafter? Before 2030, well, anything in planning before 2030 should already be in the books because uh, it takes 10 years to build something. So I, I, I'm really worried about exactly what you said because Tenet went to all the vendors and just said, okay, let's buy. 11 links. So in the numbers that I showed, this is 22 converters. That's quite a bit of the supply chain. Um, we only have three vendors in Europe today. It's not a lot. There's not a lot of competition. Um, it would be nice if the, the market opens up. Um, but I, I, I think we're looking at 2030 to 2040 and not necessarily to 20. Uh, before 2030, because I, I think we're, yeah, we need to take action so that we can get things done by 2030. Yeah. Okay, then uh, thank you. Thank you, Dirk, again, for uh, for this presentation. I'd now like to uh, introduce uh, Professor Lee, who is currently a professor at the Department of Electronic and Electrical Engineering at the University of Strathclyde. Uh, welcome, um, Okay, it's a bit too tall for me. <laughs> uh, thanks, Leah, for the introduction, and uh, thanks for, for the invitation from John and the Supernote. Yeah, uh, so, so my name is Li Zhu. I'm a professor at Strathclyde University, and uh, together with uh, Dirk's team at KU Leuven and uh, Supernote, so we conduct a piece of uh, research uh, studies looking at uh, the, uh, you know, the use of DC overlay uh, on top of the uh, uh, AC network we, we have uh, on a continental uh, level 
to 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 uh, to investigate uh, to look at uh, the feasibility and the challenges we 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 have. So uh, so uh, we believe this is the first piece of study to demonstrate uh, the feasible you know approach to the architecture operation and the control of uh, you know uh, DC uh, uh, overlay uh, at a continental scale. Uh, so that's the uh, the main aim uh, of the uh, of the uh, the work we have conducted together. Uh, so start with uh, the the methodology we have been taking. Yeah. So we we took a uh, continental scale, you know, uh, energy scenario. So that includes the generation profile and the load profile and uh, the uh, transmission asset. Then uh, we uh, we group them together into six different AC zooms, and the four are interconnected, uh, and the other two are islanded uh, 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 AC zoom. We will uh, uh, see a bit more details later on. And uh, then on top of this exi existing six AC zooms, we we uh, envisage uh, a DC overlay uh, on top of this, and then we uh, put uh, the basic you know uh, 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 network structure as well as the energy scenario into this uh, OPF algorithm, which uh, was developed by, by Dirk's team at KU Leuven. And from the OPF uh, uh, algorithm, uh, then we, we define the size and the detailed architecture of the ACDC overlay grid. Uh, once we define the, uh, the architecture of the grid, uh, obviously considering the different energy scenarios, then we uh, come up with uh, a sort of control strategy in order to operate the system on the steady state and also on the different contingency events. And uh, finally, we develop a model together with all the control strategies uh, uh, to test five different scenarios. Uh, 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 so that's what, what we are going to, uh, to see a bit of details uh, later on. Again, uh, looking at this OPF algorithm, uh, we take the uh, the uh, energy scenario. This work on. Oh, okay. We 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 take the energy scenario. We also include some cost evaluations, and together with the various uh, grid and uh, generation constraints. Obviously, we also need to uh, consider the physics. You know, uh, governing the uh, the V and I, the power flow in a, a network. Then we feed everything into this OPF. Uh, so this OPF model calculates the optimized settings for the generation, for the converter, and for the power flow in the AC-DC network. And uh, uh, the circuit, right? The sizing of the circuit will, uh, 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 are defined to, to ensure you know, the required transmission across different AC-DC zooms are met considering different energy scenarios. And then we also use the APF uh, results to guide the control system to change the set point after a particular or certain contingency. So that's what we, we have done. Right, okay, so now come to the, uh, the architecture, right? As we, uh, uh, as I mentioned, we group the continental system into six different zooms. We have four uh, meshed AC zoom, so from three to six. We also have two islanded AC network, zoom one and zoom two. Within each zoom, we have a certain, you know, uh, uh, generation, which is a mix of offshore, offshore, PV, and some storage and conventional uh, generation as well. Then we have a certain amount of demand according to the energy scenario we considered. And uh, as you see here, within the AC grid, we also have the point-to-point -point AC uh, uh, interconnections between uh, uh, the I, uh, well, zoom one, two, uh, three, and four, and also between zoom two and, and some of the other AC zooms. Then we build a DC overlay. As you see here, we consider, uh, sorry, yeah, a dedicated uh, DC, you know, zoom, uh, corresponding to each AC zooms here. So, uh, and the, uh, the, the DC overlay are meshed for uh, the five uh, DC zooms, but also this uh, second zoom two only uh, have a, 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 you know, a connection to, to zoom three, as you see here. So, uh, 
the, the power flow between the DC and the AC obviously uh, uh, is through, through the, uh, the dedicated high capacity HVDC converters. And uh, the, uh, the set point and the power flow uh, within the zone itself and also between the AC and the DC zones are governed by the, uh, the OPF results. Yeah, so we calculate the OPF results, then we we, we, we give certain you know, set point for, for the different DC converters for the different generations. Uh, on the control side, we mainly consider the two uh, uh, different uh, uh, layers, right? One is uh, very much related to the distributed control layer. Another one is uh, related to the more centralized uh, control layer. So, so we can uh, see for the distributed control, uh, we have uh, 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 the local control, which are implemented at the low level of the generation and the, 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 the converter stations. And we also have certain primary control, right, which help to regulate the frequency. For example, we have the, uh, 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 the, 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 you know, the free active power frequency tube in, implemented in, in uh, some of our generators. We can also implement certain frequency response for our converter uh, uh, stations. Then on the uh, more centralized control, we it, it's related to the redispatch of the you know uh, 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 of the uh, power in a uh, command, and also try to optimize the, the power flow based on the uh, the uh, say economic consideration and the various constraints of the generators and the transmission assets. Uh, so come to the uh, the five contingencies uh, we have studied. So what we uh, 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 consider was, uh, uh, I'd say a more critical, you know, time series. So, so we took this time series, yeah. Then we consider the five uh, contingency events. And this time series related to a high demand with low generation, yeah. And we consider this is a more challenge and more critical uh, 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 event from the glute, from the system aspect. Uh, I don't want to go through the details of the five contingency. And uh, for, 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 for this short presentation, I will introduce the first two, but I think uh, for the uh, white paper, which will come out very shortly, will uh, detail the, uh, the all the five uh, uh, contingencies. And based on the, uh, the, the, the energy scenario, based on the good architecture and also the, the, the different you know, uh, a layer of control, we have implemented a detailed model in, uh, in PSCAD, which obviously is widely used in, in the power industry to investigate, to, to study how the system will behave uh, during uh, uh, various you know, uh, contingency events. So, okay, so this just shows uh, uh, the operation contingency before the, uh, the, the five contingency we, 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 we studied. So in this uh, particular scenario, we have uh, a very high uh, uh, power generation in the AC zone three, okay? So as a consequence of this, as you see here, as you see the, uh, the arrow pointed out uh, on the power flow, we have significant amount of power flow out from zone three to the rest of the zones, either through the AC or through the DC part, as you see. So we have a certain amount of power coming from the AC to the DC zone three through the HVDC converter, then transmit to the rest of the uh, AC zones through the, uh, the various uh, DC zones, yeah? Uh, similarly, we have power transmit from uh, AC zone three to one, to to, to four and to five through the AC and the DC interconnectors. Uh, and for, for, the, uh, for testing the, uh, the, the behavior of the system, we uh, use the multiple converters in the DC zone three to regulate the DC voltage in our DC overlay. So they will act as a master uh, DC voltage controller to balance the overall power coming and out into and from the, uh, from the DC, DC grid. And the main purpose is to demonstrate the, uh, the operational, uh, operation, optimal operation and the stability of, 
uh, with the overall AC-DC hybrid uh, circuit. Uh, so the first scenario we considered was uh, uh, looking into uh, what would happen if we lose one of the uh, uh, master VDC controller within DC uh, zone three. So, so, so for, for the study, we uh, 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 suddenly uh, uh, lose uh, a three gigawatt of power uh, transmitted through one of the converters connected to, to the, uh, the, the DC zone three. Uh, in this uh, particular you know, uh, 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 scenario, uh, before the, uh, the contingency, uh, the, we, we do have spare capacities within the converters in, in DC zone three. So the consequence of the loss of this one single converter actually means that uh, the transmitted power through this converter before the contingency can actually be uh, picked up by the rest of the healthy converters in DC zone three very quickly within milliseconds. And uh, the overall response of the system means uh, 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 the, the power uh, will simply be shifted from this converter to the rest of the healthy converter in DC zone three. And uh, the overall DC power flow within the DC overlay, as well as the power transmission from the AC and the DC and the power transmission within the over uh, uh, overall AC grid, uh, uh, they are not affected. Yeah, so just to, to, to demonstrate the flexibility of operation when we have a DC system. Yeah. Uh, the second scenario we looked at is uh, related to the loss of a uh, 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 DC line within the DC overlay grid here. So as, as I mentioned earlier, we have a DC meshed grid for from one, three, uh, four, five, six. Yeah. And now we, we, we lost a, a, a DC line within the DC meshed grid. Okay. And I think Dirk mentioned about the importance for, for DC protection. Yeah, so, so uh, obviously the detail of the DC protection is, uh, is uh, out of the scope of this project. So what do we consider? Sorry, sorry, uh, sorry. Yeah, okay, yeah. So what do we considered here is we, we have a, a, a fully selective DC protection with fast acting DC circuit breaker installed at the DC line. So once we have a fault and the fault can be quickly detected and then we open the DC circuit breaker here to uh, uh, quickly isolate it, uh, uh, isolate the, the faulty DC line. So the detailed uh, DC fault protection, again, as I mentioned, is outside of the scope of this project. But what do we uh, consider here when we have a fault here, this faulty line can be quickly isolated in, in our study. Uh, right, okay, so, so when a fault happened here, when this line is isolated fairly quickly, uh, obviously before the fault, we transmit, uh, I think it was four gig three gigawatt power from DC zone three to DC zone four, okay? Because of the loss of this DC line, then the, uh, the power previously transmitted through this line will be naturally redistributed through uh, 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 the, the mesh, the DC network and other lines, according to the simple Ohm's law, the Kirchhoff voltage law, Kirchhoff's current law. So this will happen naturally, okay? And uh, will happen fairly quickly within milliseconds. Uh, so as you see here, so we lost this line. So certain amount of power will then transmit through this line, through zoom one to four, and a certain amount will through this line from five to four, and also through this line to six, then to five and to four. And this power flow will happen automatically, as I mentioned, it will be based on the physics. Uh, because of the, uh, the, the, the rating of the different DC lines, the consequence of, of the lead distribution of the, uh, the power across the, the DC overlay actually cause some of the lines to be overloaded, okay? So for example, I think this line is is overloaded because the, the rating of this line is relatively small, okay? But, but one uh, uh, important uh, 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 point to emphasize is none of the power converters are overloaded because the power transmission through the uh, converters between the DC and the AC are not affected. And uh, 
uh, the redistribution lead, lead is uh, about the different DC lines on, on the DC overlay. Okay, so that's, that's uh, uh, one important uh, point to note. But obviously, you know, the, the cables will have a much higher uh, overload capability compared to, to the converter. Uh, so, so the system will survive, yeah, uh, 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 will continue to operate based on the new uh, uh, power flow. And then we can use the optimal power flow algorithm to, uh, uh, to work out uh, the, the new set of, of operation conditions by modifying the set point of the, the converters as well as modifying the generation capacity at different uh, uh, AC zones. Because in, in this particular example, uh, uh, the, the, the transmission capacity out from zone AC zone three are uh, pretty much full. So, so the loss of this line doesn't mean we have to reduce the generation at uh, AC zone here while to in, in increase the generation at uh, 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 AC, zone, uh, AC zone five. So this will enable us to quickly move into a, a new you know, steady state optimal operating point. So that come to my last slide and the conclusion of, of this short, uh, uh, well, this, this piece of work, okay? So we believe we, we again, we demonstrated for the first uh, ever feasible approach to, to, to the development of pollution protection and the control of a, a large continental level DC overlay grid. And we have implemented uh, different layers of control to ensure the power can be balanced uh, uh, under normal operation and uh, system stability can be maintained in the event of contingencies. And, uh, and we have also fully utilized the, the flexible contribuity of these high capacity uh, DC converters and the DC grid. And overall, although I think we've not talked too much in the slides here, we have demonstrated the increased RES generation and the transmission capacity can be achieved slow the increase the system flexibility uh, enabled by a meshed DC overlay grid. But I think this will be featured in, in the forthcoming white paper. I think that's all, all for my, my presentation. Hope oh, it's not, I didn't use too much of the 15 minutes. <laughs> Well, you're you're right on time. Okay, right? thank That's you. Yeah, I, I have to follow John and uh, and the Dirk example, you know. <laughs> yeah, no. So thank you very much for that first uh, ever feasible approach to uh, development, operation, protection, and control of a, a, a continental scale DC overlay grid. Uh, do we have any questions? Um, I think that it was, uh, we are still digesting all the, the numbers uh, that you sent to us. And, um, indeed, so uh, there will be a white paper shared uh, uh, with the participants uh, and with everyone after this, uh, after this session where we can read uh, more about, yeah. um, in more detail about this desk overlay grid. Okay, okay thank, thank you. you. I would uh, now like to call uh, to the stage uh, uh, Owen Hodge, Chief Engineer at Supernode, um, to present whether superconductors can contribute to filling uh, this gap. Thank you. Owen. Thanks. Thanks very much, Leila. Um, I'm conscious I'm the last person before your coffee break, so I'll make sure I try and keep on time. OK. Um, so I'm Owen Hodge, I'm the Chief Engineer in Supernode. Um, today I'll talk to you about various technology options, transmission technology options that can deliver the decarbonized grid we need by 2050. In particular, I'll focus on superconducting technology. Um, it's what we're developing ourselves in Supernode. Um, I'll give you an overview of the status of superconducting power cables. I'll discuss some of the advantages of superconducting transmission. And I will um, discuss what I think are key enabling features for superconducting transmission that make it an ideal technology option for the transmission grid of the future and the one we need to decarbonize our energy system. Okay, um, so what are the challenges that lie before us? So we've seen this discussed by some of the previous presenters. I think the first challenge we have is really financial. So we, we need to develop a new transmission system. We need a new energy system and we need to invest in it. 
that's well established. Um, Dirk presented some of the the accountancy around that. If we, if we move away from the accountancy, just at a at a societal level, uh, investment in a new transmission system will enable us to stop importing expensive fossil fuels, to have energy independence, um, and to deliver a clean, green, and renewable energy system for all of our societies in Europe. On the technology front, um, I see three overarching technical challenges for transmission looking out over the next number of decades. They are capacity, so we need a bigger electrical system. That's a, a capacity challenge for transmission. The next is range, so we need to move power over long distances. That's a challenge for transmission, a new challenge. And the next is, is operability. So we already have a transmission system or multiple transmission systems. We need a new energy approach. We need a new energy transmission system that needs to work with the, the underlying AC system. To focus in on those a bit more, firstly, capacity. Um, if we consider the European Union 1.5 tech scenario, um, we understand that we need to triple the size of our electricity system and triple the size of our electricity grid to allow us to decarbonize. That's a lot of electrical capacity that we have to move around. We simply don't have the infrastructure currently to do that. Um, so we need to address that through investment and, and through technology development. Um, you see, you've seen the presentation by John, uh, the relay project, we've calculated that an optimum circuit size for such a decarbonized energy system is in or around six gigawatts, so much bigger capacities than we're currently able to accommodate with the technology that's available today. The second challenge is range and distance. So we're going to move away from the current paradigm whereby we co-locate electrical generation with our demand centers to one where in a renewables-based energy system, the generation is remote. So we need to move vast quantities of power over long distances. And to do that, we need to use DC technology, right? There are really technical reasons why AC doesn't work. I'll discuss that briefly in the coming slides. And then the third challenge is operability. Um, we need a, a DC grid that operates, uh, interlinks, uh, functions optimally with the underlying AC grid. Um, there's lots of work happening in this space broadly in Europe. We've seen the Ready for DC project concluded late last year. Interopera is up and running, looking at multi-terminal DC systems. We've seen the outcomes of the presentation uh, of the project that Professor Lee and ourselves and KU Leuven undertook um, on a continental scale DC overlay grid, how we would operate that, protect it, how we would stabilize it. So we have a good understanding of what the approach would be to achieve and our operability and, uh, and what the challenges are that we need to overcome there. So we know we need to invest a lot of money. Um, we know at a high level what the challenges are that we need to address. The next question is what technologies can solve those challenges? What technologies can really deliver a, a decarbonized energy system for Europe? Um, so I'll take you through some of the options um, and then I'll focus in on, on superconductivity, which we think is a, an enabling technology for this challenge. So the first is the obvious one, it's overhead transmission. Overhead transmission is all around us in Europe. Um, most of our transmission systems are based on, on pylons and overhead lines. Um, some people like to hook pylons, most people don't. Um, they're not very popular. Um, what we're showing on, on in the image on the right is a 12 gigawatt circuit um, that's operating in China. It's uh, 1200 kilovolts in voltage level. It's 3000 kilometers long and it's moving uh, hydropower from the northwest of China over to, to Beijing and Shanghai where their demand centers are. The pylons are around 200 meters high. So that's something that the public are just not going to accept in Europe. So we need a different solution. We look at cables. Um, cables are everywhere in our, in our electrical systems. They're generally at distribution level. Um, they're generally AC cables. AC cables are technically not capable of long distance bulk power transfer. Um, a case in point, um, more re most recently deployed in Europe would be the Hornsey project, where we have gig one gigawatt uh, wind farms connected through AC cables and we need reactive compensation at halfway across the transmission length. So that's a challenge for, for the kind of bulk power uh, capacity and, and distance that we need to move power over in a decarbonized energy system. So then we move on to what's more conventional, so DC systems. Um, we've seen a lot of progress uh, technically and from a project perspective with conventional HVDC cables over the last 10 or 15 years on the associated electrical equipment. And that's really welcome. Um, that's culminated in the, the tenant projects, the, the 22 gigawatts of HVDC connection 
in the North Sea that's going to bring power into the Netherlands and into Germany. And that will do a lot to, to get us towards 2030 in Europe. But beyond that, we see it as being quite constrained. Um, it's constrained because supply chains can't keep up with the, the acceleration that we need to deliver to decarbonize our energy systems. And the systems are just basically very expensive. Um, one solution is to go higher and higher in voltage, which the cables can probably do. When you scale in voltage, you scale the whole system in voltage and the system scales in size. When the electrical equipment gets bigger, it gets really expensive. It gets difficult to manufacture, it gets difficult to mobilize, it gets difficult to install. And you're kind of back to square one where um, we have a, a situation where we have made a link between, between voltage and power. Voltage is essentially a proxy for power. If we need more power, more capacity, we go higher in voltage and we're into cost and, and, and supply chain problems. So we need to break that link and superconductors are a technology that can do that. Uh, with superconductors, you can achieve the power capacity that you need, but you can do it at lower voltages. Um, and we think that's really a high value proposition and, and enabling for the future energy system. Okay, so uh, here I'll give you um, an overview of the state of the art for superconducting power cables. So firstly, what is superconductivity? So superconductors are materials that exhibit no electrical resistance when they are, are, are cooled, when they meet, meet certain criteria, they're cooled. Um, in superconducting power cables, we generally use liquid nitrogen as the coolant, so we cool them down to minus 200 degrees, and then we can operate them in a very power dense way. So the superconducting material is normally manufactured into tapes. Um, I'm not sure if the pointer is working here. The tapes you can see in the, the image on the on the right, the tapes then are uh, combined together and wound into a cable, pretty much like a copper cable. And that's how you get a, a power cable that's made from superconductors. As I say, we operate the, the cooling system using liquid nitrogen. Um, it's very convenient, very cheap, very abundant, a very well understood cryogen. Um, the key advantage in terms of power cables is that you can uh, leverage the, the lack of any electrical resistance or any electrical losses to have a very power dense system. So a very current dense and a very power dense cable. And that allows you to reduce the system voltage and to achieve really high power capacities in a power cable. Okay, superconducting cables are, are not new technology per se. Um, there are numerous examples of them operating very safely in power grids around the world. Um, probably in Europe, the most prominent is the um, the Ampacity project uh, delivered by, by Nexons in Essen in Germany, which ran for seven years. It was a one kilometer length, 40 MVA, 10 kiloamp AC system. Um, a similar project is the, the Shingle project in Seoul. It's a KEPCO asset. Uh, it's been running now for five years. Similar ratings, about a kilometer long, 50 MVA, 23 kV. Another similar project in the States is the, the ComEd uh, REG Chicago project. Again, similar ratings, about a kilometer in length. Um, two, two projects to note that are significant. The first is the Best Paths project. So many of you will know the Best Paths project, um, broadly focused in on, on different power systems development. But there was a work package on superconducting power uh, cable development as well. Um, and in that work package, uh, the researchers demonstrated a 4.2 gigawatt power capacity operating at 320 kV for a DC superconducting cable. So that's a really really significant and we've demonstrated high power capacity in a superconducting DC cable. Um, lastly, I'll just highlight the, the NKT project, the Superlink project in Munich, which is on track to be delivered in 2027. It really signals a, a step change in acceptance, utility acceptance for this type of technology. It indicates a step change in the applicability and the functionality of the technology. So it's a 12 kilometer long superconducting cable system under the city of Munich. It's 500 megawatts in, in rating. So it's really getting into transmission levels of power um, and it's operating at 110 kV. So what's, what's common about all these projects is that they're generally resolving challenges around urban congestion. They're generally deployed in urban dense environments. Um, in Supernode, we're leveraging the maturity in this technology to develop a superconducting cable transmission technology um, that addresses some of the challenges that, that present in the, the, the first generation of superconducting cables when applied to that, that application. And I'll detail that further on in the, the presentation. Okay, so just at a high level, some of the advantages of, of superconductivity in transmission. Um, first, we look at a material comparison. So this is a typical um, two gigawatt, a cross section of a typical two gigawatt power cable. Um, as you can see, it's mainly copper. It's kind of what you'd expect. Copper and electrical insulation, XLP, 
weighs about 40 tons per kilometer. Um, the equivalent in a superconducting cable is presented here. It's about half the weight. It's much more compact. Um, you can see straight away we're not using much uh, commodity metals, such as copper. We have, a, we have a small amount of copper, but not that much. Mainly the cable, and this is a super node cable, um, mainly the cable is comprised of, of uh, low-cost polymers, so high-density polyethylene or crossing polyethylene, some liquid nitrogen, which is inert and abundant and cheap. Um, and the superconducting material itself is a very small part. It's just this green sliver here. A very small part of the cable, which makes it very scalable. So if we want to increase the, the power capacity of the cable, we just need to increase the amount of tape. So there's no significant impact on the geometry or the cost of the cable, and we can scale this technology to very high power capacities, which you can't do with copper, and that's what we're presenting here. So, for example, for Supernode, we have a baseline design, a two gigawatt cable. We can easily convert that into a six gigawatt cable by adding more tape. Um, there's no impact on OPEX, there's very little impact on cost. Whereas if you were to do that with, with copper, you essentially need more of these systems. You need more cables, essentially multiple two gigawatt cables to deliver that power corridor. So superconductors are scalable and they're a very efficient way to deliver high capacity power corridors. Um, the takeaway from this slide really is all about consentability. So we know some of the, the high capacity cable projects in Europe, um, for example, the, the Sudling project, its main challenge isn't really technical, it's consenting, it's timeline. With a superconducting cable, because you can operate the system at lower voltage and at much higher power density, it can be much more compact. It was much more compact, um, you have smaller rights of way, you've reduced environmental footprint, not just on the, the cable leeway, but on all the auxiliary and connecting equipment, and it makes it much more acceptable to the public and much quicker to roll out for a transmission system. Okay, and then the last key advantage. So what I'm presenting here is um, the outcome of some research that we've done with Professor Lee's uh, research group on the integration and operation of meshed DC grids using our superconducting cable technology. So firstly, superconducting cables can be designed to be fault tolerant, so they can run in an overload condition as you can with copper cables. But there's an inherent current limiting capability that a superconducting cable can also provide. And that's what we're leveraging in this study. So you can see that when there's a fault occur, occurs, oh, sorry, when a fault occurs on, on, the, on the grid, um, I'm pointing at the image on the, the right, the graph. Yeah, when a fault occurs on the grid, we can see that before the DC circuit breaker even needs to open, the cable itself has act, acted to, to quench the fault and reduce the fault current level. And that, that's very useful. So we can leverage that in how we uh, approach design and development of DC circuit breakers. And in a mesh grid uh, situation, this inherent capability of the cable can be used to act as a firewall to stop propagation of faults around mesh DC grids. So that's really, really useful. Okay, so now on to next generation superconductors and, and what we're doing in Supernode. Um, so as I said, we're, we're scaling the technology. Superconducting power cables are, are already a mature technology. We're scaling that for transmission. So we're scaling it for capacity, for power capacity. We're scaling it for transmission distance. And we're scaling it for volume manufacturing, which is really a proxy for cost. So we're designing a system that can be manufactured at scale, so it's low in cost. And we have numerous innovations that we're working on to deliver that. For example, we're developing new cryostat materials. So you might have noticed in the, the other uh, image, the Nexans type cable, that the cryostats are steel. We've developed polymeric cryostats. We've developed new advanced thermal insulation that makes the system very effective and very efficient. And we've developed a novel outer cryostat technology that, that allows us to volume manufacture the, the system. Um, so we're well on our way. Uh, we're currently at a TRL of, of four achieved last year. We're working through TRL five this year, and we expect to achieve uh, a technology readiness level of six by 2025. So just to look at our, our path to commercialization. Um, as I say, this year, we're going to deliver the technology to a TRL level of five. And in parallel, we're going to undertake a demonstration project with a UK TSO in their innovation center in, in, um, in England. So we'll operate our, our, our next generation superconducting technology uh, with a six kiloamp current rating, and we'll operate that in their substation for six weeks at the end of the year. So it's a really exciting milestone for us. Um, Moving on to next year, we'll, we'll proceed with our, our qualification program. 
and we'll deliver the, the technology to a technology readiness level of six with DMV certification. Looking beyond that then to 2026, um, we currently have plans under development to demonstrate our technology in a marine environment with a European offshore wind developer and a European TSO. So again, that's a really exciting uh, milestone for us. That will certainly be a, a world first for super inducting cables. And beyond that, then we're developing projects with TSOs and DSOs such that we can pilot our technology in real world grids at medium voltage and medium power, such that we have a technology ready for commercialization then towards the end of the decade. And we can, we can address the, the increase in renewables acceleration and the transmission challenges that present through the 2030s. Okay, so just to, to summarize, um, we know we need bigger grids. Um, I think a, a takeaway I had from the NCOE ONDP last, uh, last month or the end of January was that we need to accelerate our, our delivery of renewables by a factor of nine to reach our targets. So it's really, really ambitious. And we need to be ambitious about grids as well to allow us to deliver that. So we need high capacity, highly meshed grids um, to allow us to, to deliver our renewables, to, uh, to renewables connection targets. The technology needs to be DC for, for bulk power, high capacity, long distance transmission. We believe a technology gaps, gap exists in DC transmission. Um, we need to deliver a renewable energy system that's something like 2000 gigawatts, 2500 gigawatts. If we do that incrementally in one gigawatt or two gigawatt steps, it's gonna be a lot of cables, a lot of projects, a lot of equipment. There's a gap there. We need something to come in that's higher capacity that can do that more efficiently. And we think that superconducting cables are the technology that can do that. They can deliver the scale, the speed, and the efficiency that we need to decarbonize our energy system. That's it for me. Thank you very much, Owen. A clear case for how superconductors are going to solve all the challenges you've seen up until now. Um, are there any questions from the audience? Yeah. Yeah, my name is Eric Lecomte from the European Commission, EG Energy. So my question is uh, the capability of limiting the current in case of fault. Yep. Does it mean that the resistance of the cable is going up to reduce uh, the current? Um, yeah, exactly. That's what happens. So there are different criticalities to be met to achieve superconductivity in that in superconducting materials. So one is there's a magnetic field criticality. There's a temperature criticality, which we address with liquid nitrogen. There's also a current criticality. So the performance of the, the tape or the material is nonlinear. Um, we know how to design the cables so that they're very safely operated, but we can also design them such that they act as a, as a firewall for, for fault propagation through mesh DC systems. And it's leveraging that, that property of the tape and learning how to manage a system and how to operate a system such that you can safely do that is really a key innovation focus for us in Supernode. Um, we have one online as well, but I first take the one online. Uh, thanks. So uh, this is from um, a person who's called Magni. Uh, on longer sections, how do you maintain the liquid nitrogen at minus 200 degrees? Yeah, so we have uh, numerous approaches to do that. Essentially, um, we're developing a really efficient thermal insulation. So it's state of the art, um, it's cutting edge. Yeah, it's better than state of the art, it's cutting edge. Um, and the objective there in, in, in incorporating that in our cables is that we can extend the distance between cooling and pumping stations. Ultimately, we can't uh, defeat the laws of physics and there will be some thermal ingress into the cable and we will need to recool the liquid nitrogen. And we're developing highly industrialized uh, solutions to do that in, in Supernode with our partners in, in, in Acro Solutions. So we're using mature cryocooling technology to allow us to, to withdraw, recool, and then re-inject the liquid nitrogen very efficiently. Thanks, Owen. Um, to Sebastian, I'll be pressing again. Um, I will have many questions about the technology, but we can do that at the yeah. break. Uh, just one, uh, and I understand here the, the, the point of having DC uh, superconducting grids, especially to bring a large amount of power to, uh, to the continent. I also see this, the point of an overlay grid, but still, um, have you investigated and why have you then given up, if then, uh, the possibility to use superconducting for AC uh, parts of the, uh, of the grid? So there are some examples about it in yeah. terms of fault limitation, in terms of uh, quicker implementation. So that could be also a business case or isn't there one? Um, potentially, 
um, we have looked at it. Um, that there's an inherent difference in how superconducting material behaves, um, conducting AC versus DC. So there is a, a loss, a, a, a superconducting loss, an AC loss, when you run uh, AC current through a superconductor, and it makes it less efficient. And that's a that's a big reason why DC is better. Um, but AC superconductivity is actually very useful at high power capacities also. It, it extends that, that real power uh, transfer distance that's quite limited with copper by m many multiples, essentially. Um, I guess the reason why we focused on DC is really the, we've determined that it is the most efficient way to, to transmit power through a DC superconductor. There is literally zero electrical loss, nothing at all. So it's very, very efficient if you can develop a very efficient thermal insulation and a very efficient thermal approach, which we're doing in supernova. Do we have any last very pressing, we have time for maybe one more very pressing question. But if there are none, then I suggest we go to the coffee break okay. uh, exactly on time. So thanks to all the speakers for that. Um, after the break, we will have uh, uh, NSOE joining remotely. We will have uh, uh, Dr. Anche Ort uh, uh, joining, uh, and we will have as well uh, uh, Eric Lecombe from the commission. So that's after the coffee break. So, but for now, uh, well-deserved uh, coffee. Coming back uh, after the break, we now have uh, Anche Ort, Dr. Anche Ort uh, from the Danish TSO EnergiNet. Um, and within NSOE, she elaborated, uh, she led the elaboration of the offshore uh, network uh, development plans. And she is uh, joining us uh, from uh, Denmark, where it's not so easy to travel to Brussels uh, until the 1st of April, is my understanding. Um, as a reminder to those online, uh, to ask the questions through Slido so that we can make sure that we that we get to the questions. So through the Zoom, we might not uh, see them. So that's just a reminder uh, to everyone. And now I'd like to uh, give the floor to uh, uh, to Anja, if we can hear her. Thanks a lot, and thanks for having me also remotely. Um, I'm told by my screen that the host disabled me to sharing slides. Could you maybe activate it? Now it should work. Super. So then I think we can start. Um, yeah, I'm sorry that I cannot be there and I saw a lot of familiar faces. So I uh, hope you had a nice break. Um, yeah, so let's see what we found in NCOE. So uh, we investigated um, the offshore network development plan, or we have the task according to the 10E regulation to do the offshore network development plan. And so we had less than half the time than we have for the regular TYNDP. And, and uh, so let's see what we did. So the ONDP is the translation of the member states non-binding risk capacity targets into network equip infrastructure equipment needs and their costs. So, so this was the task that we have. Member states deliver the targets. We, we, we deliver an estimate um, on the infrastructure. Next step will be that commission comes with guidelines how to share the cost. And after that, and again, NSOE has to apply the methodology on the ONDP and then we will see um, who pays what. So again, the ONDP is a number of reports. Uh, what we did is we produced a pan-European report um, uh, showing the general findings also across the sea basins. Then we have five sea basin reports. We have a methodology report where we, you can also find the cost assumptions and everything. And we have a report on how we engaged with stakeholders underways of course, this will be more intense uh, in the next edition, but uh, now we focus to the 10E corridors, so member states, regulators, commission, uh, Wind Europe and ASA. And then uh, we also have a very nice visualization tool, so which you might wish to play with the figures and to extract whatever um, interests you, so generation, transmission, um, impact on CO2, 
the energy mix. You can find everything there for each decade. Yeah, and you even find a small film taking two minutes to take you along um, the findings. Just a recap how to uh, how this product is linked to our standard products. So usually for the TYNDP, uh, we start with a scenario process. Actually, the next uh, scenario process for the TYNDP 26 will start in September already this year. So we start with the scenarios where we define plausible futures. Um, we have usually one, which is bottom up. So collection of uh, the members in NECP, so, so the National Energy and Climate Plans and the National Figures Best Knowledge. And then we have two variant scenarios, which investigate um, how futures could look like if we assume certain framework conditions. And along that storyline, then we build uh, the top-down or variant scenarios. Next step is then that we, based on these um, scenarios, we find the needs. So what is needed, what infrastructure or what uh, measures are needed to transport the energy from A to B or to facilitate exchange of energy across the European network. And as part of this needs identification, uh, the ONDP is part of that process. Right now, it's separated from the ongoing 2024 process, but in, in principle, it's part of the needs assessment for Europe. Afterwards, we collect the projects from um, project promoters, which can be third-party promoters or TSOs. And these projects should then respond to the needs which had been identified before. These projects are then in the next step uh, assessed against the scenarios with a cost benefit assessment. So each project gets kind of 13 to 15, I thought, um, indicators. And then we can, uh, projects can be compared and we know what the benefits and, uh, for the, of each single project are for the pan European system. And the cost, of course, are pro uh, given by the promoters. All this TYNDP is then input to the European uh, process of um, project of common interest, which is steered by the European Commission. Just to recap where to allocate this ONDP. Also recap um, what it is. So we the ONDP is a bit a different mandate than the usual TYNDP, so because it answers a different question than you are used to seeing. So the offshore network plan answers the questions how, what does it take to integrate the roughly 500 gigawatt of offshore rays, which we receive from the member states, into the, um, into the dis distributed energy environment, as a, into one of our scenarios which we applied. So this means that during the optimization process, the optimizer only could invest into offshore transmission infrastructure, connecting the rest or connecting the nodes with each other, or the rest was kept stable and was locked. For comparison, when we do the scenarios, the question is answered, how could the European system look like in the environment distributed energy in these time horizons? And the question when we do the needs identification is, where could the system be more economically efficient? So this means also that the optimizer gets different tasks. For the scenario, it can invest in a lot of assets and measures, which you can see under A. And for the needs identification, it can invest in mainly infrastructure, peaking units, storage and flexibility issues from a list of candidate projects. So far, the offshore hybrid projects had not been part of this identification project, uh, process because so far we did not have the mandate to do that. This has changed with the last edition of the regulation. Also a disclaimer, so as we had only half of the time as uh, usually, we had to limit ourselves. So this means we used the T1EP22 model as this was ready to use. And then we mounted the member state offshore targets on it. So we did not do an economic evaluation and, and no an adjustment of the overall product portfolio. And we did linear expansion. In the TYNDP, usually we use mixed integer optimization. 
um, but here we used linear optimization. We also um, increased the um, consumption across um, Europe with 8% to represent electrification better. So now I said that we used the T1EP22 model um, and the scenario, this is just a recap how the scenario looked like back in T1EP22. These were data collection from 21 and 2020. So it's, it's the scenario in the middle. So we modeled all the different fuel types, all the generation across Europe in the European model. Um, and you see that we exchanged the, for 2040 time horizons, we exchanged the two, 260 gigawatt offshore wind, which was in the model, we exchanged by uh, 382, so plus 120 gigawatts. And also in uh, 2050, we, ex uh, we added 90 gigawatts on top of it. And also it could be that the allocation to countries was different compared to what it was before. This was the only change we did to the model and increased the demand, as I said before. Um, I included also the link. If you want to dive into the scenarios, you can find all the details uh, still on the internet. So this is what we used and now how we did it. Um, this is just a schematic visualization. So we used the pan-European model and, and uh, used the starting uh, grid situation. We used the grid for the, um, for the year 2030 and then mounted the 2040 um, information on it. And then we do, did it sequentially. So we used the 2040 results uh, as a starting situation for the 50 time horizon. As a next step, then we integrated candidates between the offshore nodes. Mostly it was the far away offshore nodes uh, because close to shore does not really make sense to make huge investments. Um, then you could also directly link the countries via point-to-point -point connections. So we mainly used the far offshore, um, offshore um, wind projects, which we found in the maritime spatial plans from the countries. So there we linked these nodes or, or gave the, yeah, without any capacity. Then the optimization was done with linear optimization. And then we found certain links between certain nodes and, uh, but they, they could be of all sizes. So from 40 megawatts, nobody would build a 40 megawatt link DC or um, as high as you might think. Um, and this, uh, then we translated in the regions from, and so we, this was translated into plausible um, offshore DC sizes. And we also assumed a standard size of two gigawatt links, which is uh, quite advanced seen from today, but uh, first standards are being created by some companies already. Uh, so, so this was the general way forward. And then, um, yeah, here are the figures. Um, the bar charts indicate um, the, um, the offshore rest capacities that we received from the member states, added all up. This is including Norway and Great Britain. And you also can see these arrows between the bar charts uh, indicating how much has to be built um, each year. So this is really, really huge. Um, the nine times faster than we have been during the last decade has been mentioned already. And yes, this was really a um, huge uh, finding. So and it's already March, so I don't know if we fulfilled the statistics for this year, so we have to be really fast. Mainly this is in the Northern Seas, Sea Basin. It's not as um, challenging in the Baltic Sea and the Southern Sea Basins. Uh, they, they, have, uh, they have reachable targets, I would say. What we have done, you can see here, this is indicating um, what we gave to the optimizer. So in dark green, you can see we assumed a huge part of the offshore rest to be connected radially because these are close to the shores and no TSO would, would offer this um, for a connection, for an international connection as then the cost would 
by far exceed the benefits. So therefore, but anyway, nearly half of the capacity that would be installed in the waters was given to the optimizer to test if a connection to a international neighbor would make sense. And what you see at the bottom in light green is these are the offshore hybrid projects that we know of already today. We did not question these projects or these ideas. Um, we assumed they all will materialize. So this was kind of 26 gigawatt, if I remember correctly. And then um, I just explained this. And so what came out of it was major part of the connections will still be radial. Um, what has been identified by the offshore network development plan is just the, the tiny yellow piece on top of uh, the bar charts, and the light green is what uh, had been what is known today. Um, we also found, yeah, of course, this is a challenge for the supply chain. Um, yeah, in, in a report from IEA, I think it was, or last week in a conference, it was said that. A European industry is ready to provide half of what is needed. So, so they really would also need to invest in um, pro production capacity and they need firm commitment from TSOs or third party producers that um, somebody will buy the assets. Uh, what we also did with this product, we invited RGI, so the Renewable Grid Initiative, to um, write a chapter on the impact on um, biodiversity and nature. And so because um, having these huge offshore res inst installation in mind, we should really be careful not to harm um, the environment. And um, yeah, they, they provided a chapter and there is no, no ready recipe now. So we all have to keep on learning and collect data and maybe change our routines when we discover uh, what should be done differently um, underway. So, so we really have to keep nature and biodiversity in mind already from the planning phase. I always talk about hybrid projects. This is just a short reminder of what it is. It's essentially um, multi-purpose or it's a dual purpose infrastructure, meaning that this infrastructure is connecting two or more countries or bidding zones um, with each other and is at the same time connecting offshore rays to some shore. The generation is not part of this. And when we talk in NCOE about multipurpose, then we mean this is also crossing sectors, uh, so energy sectors, for example, um, linking with hydrogen. So just as a reminder, what is hybrid project? Sometimes it's also called um, hybrid interconnector. So now a map, uh, very simplified. Uh, we started with maritime spatial maps, having uh, the spots of individual offshore wind farms to get the distances right. But what we show in the reports is this simplified and aggregated information. Where you see, for example, the green links, these are the radial links. Um, and you remember the bar chart, it's the major part is connected radially, but here it looks very tiny and innocent, but actually that's the major part of investments to be made. And then we, we have aggregated the information of all the wind farms in an EEZ e exclusive economic zone to one spot in the waters, otherwise it would be you would not be able to see anything. And here you can see then for the scenario, I think this is the 2050 having a DC breaker, um, where which countries could be interlinked. So it is um, one out of seven gigawatt production will be connected via offshore links. Uh, and um, goes between eight to 14% of the offshore res might be connected via hybrid links. So what we will see in the, in the offshore waters is a combination of radial connections, classic point-to-point -point connections, and these offshore hybrid projects, sometimes also with multi-purpose integrating energy sectors. 
Uh, yeah, I think you all know, but just to recap why it is a good idea to interconnect markets. So you increase energy security because if you lose something at one place, then you can uh, do some switches and then you can um, send the energy via different paths to another customer. So you would not lose the energy. Uh, prices will converge when you connect markets. Um, then you also can better use the offshore as um, and also increase um, thereby the um, savings of CO2. So it's between five to eight million ton each year CO2 savings. In the T1EP22, we found 31 uh, million ton annually for the 90 gigawatts, which we found for entire Europe, just to set this in relation. Uh, the headaches is, yeah, system risk as a Dirk said it already very nicely in the beginning of the day. So we have to um, take care that we don't harm the, the rules and uh, that, that we keep the system secure. Um, the 3000 megawatt um, maximum loss of energy has been mentioned. Um, so therefore, yeah, what you said about six gigawatt would be needed as standard uh, corridors is interesting, but um, we need to take care about the reserves. So if, if we lose too much, then we will have a big blackout. Um, so far, we do, do not have operational experience with interlinked TC. So I come from Denmark. We have nine projects, if, I'm, if I remember correctly, but it's individual links to Sweden, to Norway, to uh, Great Britain, uh, to Netherlands, to, um, to Germany. But um, they all have their individual control system. But when we think about a DC grid, so then this would need some joint control and yeah, uh, some work is needed to get this done. Um, also, when we come too late, last challenge here is when we come too late with the infrastructure, then the all um, the entire development of offshore res um, is at risk. So we really have to collaborate across actors. So between suppliers, between developers, between TSOs, politicians, and every every step has to be done at the right point in time. So otherwise um, we will all fail. The challenges with infrastructure supply chain was, was already mentioned. Environmental impact is treated. Flexibility is needed for operation. Yeah, and workforce is missing everywhere, not only engineers, but also practical people, also people in the authorities. Um, that's really, a, if you have children, so motivate them to help us wherever possible in this supply chain. Anche, we are um, uh, reaching a little bit the time limit. Okay, I hurry up. So this is the long shopping, link, shopping list. Um, the route length is not cable length, it's just uh, the the nodes in the water and you can see major challenge in the northern seas huge number of converters onshore offshore and the dc breakers um i had in mind this is showing the northern seas you can see the how it evolves over time and having a dc breaker or not um yeah i think you can get the presentation afterwards and then look a bit into the pictures then i hurry up so the DC breaker essentially makes a difference with interconnectivity. If we do have one, we will see more interlinks. Interlinks are good, as just explained. If we don't have one for nearly the same price, you also get some offshore infrastructure, but you don't interlink countries and then all the benefits are lost. Um, yeah, This was just what we assumed. Uh, if Having a DC breaker, then we would, linking two links, we would install four breakers. You see the prices at the bottom. If not having one, we assume two converters and AC substations offshore would be needed. Then you see the price, it's three times the pr price. And for the Northern Seas, it was nearly similar cost, but three times um, more capacity. So this was the essence. Uh, yeah, so the next steps is we still have the online survey ongoing. So if we want to see improvements in the next edition, you're still welcome to include your comments. 
in NSOE, we will integrate the ONDP results in the TYNDP24 right now, and you will see the outcome in late autumn. Um, you, you find a lot of material on the internet, even the launch event slides and presentations, and this is where I stop. Thank you. Sorry to be low. Thank you so much, Anche. That's uh, hard about not being in the room together, uh, a little bit more challenging. Um, are there any urgent questions from the room? Otherwise, we can take them in the panel uh, discussion that we are having uh, later. Okay, so we save them for the panel uh, discussion. Thank you, Anche. We, uh, you will make another uh, appearance. Okay. I would now like to introduce uh, Erica Lecomte from DG Energy. Uh, Eric is in charge of uh, energy efficiency and transition to carbon neutrality in industry, uh, heat pumps for industrial, commercial, residential, and direct current technologies. So very much in the topic for today. Thank you, Eric. Yes, so as you rightly said, I'm coming from the unit research innovation, competitiveness, and digitalization, not the, the unit dealing with uh, networks, uh, but uh, I got some inputs from uh, from colleagues uh, in the unit C4. So uh, needless to, to say the, the importance, uh, Dirk mentioned doubling the uh, energy generation for, for electricity uh, for the, at EU level by 2050. It's also similar, uh, the, the climate target 2040 that was published uh, in, in February, uh, so just last month, mentioned multiplying by 2.4 the uh, electricity production uh, by 2050. But production is not what dimensions the grids, it's rather the capacity. Uh, and, and so the, the same modeling led to uh, a, a multiplication by 3.3 uh, of the generation, uh, the, the power generation capacity in gigawatts at, at EU level. So really a, a tremendous increase in, in power capacity. Next slide, please. So that indeed uh, shows the, the, the challenge uh, for, for the, the transmission uh, and uh, distribution grids, uh, not only with the increase uh, of uh, renewables, which are uh, variable, uh, but also the, the increase in variable uh, loads like uh, electric vehicles, uh, heat pumps, and so on. So really uh, big challenges uh, and also huge investments that were already mentioned uh, today to, to be committed uh, by 2030. Next slide, please. So for, for that, the, there was the uh, grid action plan that I will talk about, but also at the same time was published the, the list of uh, project of common interests, so the, the linking the, the member states together uh, across the borders, but also the list of uh, uh, project of mutual interest, uh, connecting the, the, the member states with the neighboring countries of, of the EU. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and so the uh, EU grid action plan is really aiming at accelerating the implementation of those projects of common interest. So ac acceleration uh, of the uh, improvement of, of the grid. So six uh, streams to, to achieve that. Uh, planning of the networks, the, the, the presentation just before was really about it. Uh, then also regulatory incentives to make it happen. Third point, smart and efficient grids, how to make the grid uh, work better. Uh, fourth point, financing, of course, very important, but also permitting uh, an acceptance as uh, it needs to be accepted by, by the public. And finally, supply chain. So these are the six points through which I will go now. Uh, uh, and next slide, please. So, yeah, oh, yeah. I didn't know I could operate the, the slides also. <laughs> so about the, the, the network planning, I think that the, the presentation just before uh, showed uh, indeed that the, the planning at the transmission level is, is to be uh, improved uh, with the 10-year national development plans but also the specifically 
the uh, offshore network development plan that uh, was really what well, that was just presented here. So that's at transmission level. Uh, also at uh, distribution level, this is something more new for the, the distribution level to to plan a, at long term the the evolution uh, of the grids. And so uh, the EU DSO entity will support the the DSOs uh, in developing this uh, planning this long-term planning at distribution level. Uh, now about the regulatory uh, incentives. Uh, indeed, uh, we have seen the, the development, the future development of the renewables, uh, notably the, the offshore. Uh, really, investments have to be made not only for the, 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 the request for connection that come day by day, but also to anticipate and have a, a more global uh, holistic view of, of the future needs. So really, uh, the, 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 the Commission, together with ACER, will uh, provide some guidance uh, for the, uh, on how to anticipate the, the investments. And uh, of course, when it's about an anticipating uh, also uh, and, and about offshore, the, the offshore renewables will benefit not only the neighboring um, member states that are on the coast and connected to, to that, uh, that uh, energy will flow through to the other member states. And so the other member states will also benefit from those renewables. And that's why the, the, the cost of this uh, infrastructure has to be shared. And so there will be more uh, guidance uh, from the commission on how to, to share the cost uh, uh, across uh, the member states, not only the ones that are uh, on, on the seashore. Third point, how to use the grids more efficiently in, in a smarter way. Uh, so first point is about uh, enhancing the grid capacity transparency, it means uh, in, better informing the developers of renewables, uh, be it PV on land or, 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 or wind uh, on land or, or offshore, to, to tell them where it, it, there is already now uh, available capacity where they could connect uh, easier uh, without having to uh, enhance the, the, the grid capacity. So a better transparency uh, already. Then also uh, uh, in, in having the, the transmission and the distribution level uh, to uptake uh, smarter grids. So uh, new, new technologies, innovative technologies uh, at that level. Also realizing that uh, more and more the, the grids uh, will not only be uh, lines of copper uh, as they become more intelligent, more software, more operational cost, uh, then CapEx will also come into play uh, and so uh, how to integrate this uh, operational cost on top of the uh, capex in the tariffs uh, that's also uh, something that will be more and more important and ace will make recommendations on how to do that fourth point is about financing uh, of course I i've talked about uh, anticipatory uh, investments uh, uh, in the grids, so those ones that will benefit in the future, but not in the very short term. Also, uh, massive investments uh, from the TSOs that will be and DSO that will be needed. Uh, all of that will uh, put them in a in a financial situation that is maybe uh, uh, affecting the 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 rating of those companies. If the rating degrades, the uh, the, the, the capacity to, to get funding from the, the, the banks uh, will be more difficult, uh, interest rates will go up, so really the uh, uh, Commission will help uh, in, in this investors dialogue to overcome, overcome these uh, obstacles, financing obstacles, and also give more visibility on the funding uh, for the, the distribution. Fifth point is indeed, uh, uh, once you have planned, when you have the money, you still have to make it uh, be uh, accepted. So uh, both the, the, the permitting by, by the authorities, 
so member states are encouraged to use the emergency regulations and the renewable energy directives, which gives the, uh, the, the permitting for grids uh, a priority level so that the, the, the authorities would be uh, quicker in, in delivering the, the, the permits. Uh, uh, but of course, uh, permits also go with uh, environmental uh, uh, studies that have to be performed to, to know the impact on the environment. Uh, and uh, uh, the Commission will come with updated uh, guidance on these environmental uh, aspects. Um, and then finally, uh, to, to get the, the acceptance, uh, the, the, the pact for, for engagement is a way to engage with the uh, local populations on a more regular basis uh, to better explain the the, the, the benefits uh, for the, the society of, of uh, the, the grids to, to make it uh, easier uh, and better accepted by, by the public. And finally, when all of that is in place, uh, we, we heard already about uh, uh, the, the supply chain. So will the industry be able to, uh, to produce everything that will be needed to, to be installed to, for the enhancements uh, of, of the grids? So one way is, of course, to have uh, more standardized specifications uh, so that the manufacturers don't have to adapt the, the products and the solutions to each and every case. Uh, uh, but, but also uh, common technical requirements for the connection uh, uh, of generation and demand. So not only on the equipment, but uh, have more common requirements uh, on, on the way to request the, the, the connection of either generation or of, of, of demand. Uh, and finally, the, there is the uh, Net Zero Industry Act, that is not really uh, that was not really part of the um, grid action plan because the, the net zero industry act is not yet uh, adopted but uh, in in the meantime the the net zero industry act reached uh, an agreement uh, between the, the, the parliament and, and the council meaning that uh, now it's only a, a question of finalizing the text uh, so that uh, it would be uh, also translated in, in languages uh, of the EU and eventually uh, published. So there, the uh, uh, Net Zero Industry Act specifically identifies the, the grids uh, as a, a critical technology that will enable uh, the, the net zero transition. And so with uh, measures that make easier the, the, the permitting also to construct those manufacturing plants. So easier permitting to, 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 to build uh, factories to, to produce the equipment, but also support for, for skills uh, and uh, to, to, to meet this new demand for skilled uh, engineer technicians that uh, will be needed. So that's not the end of my, how many minutes do I still have? Yeah. A few minutes here. So that was the main, the, the most important of the presentation. I wanted also to share uh, a few things with you, uh, which is a bit beyond the, the, this topic, so I can stop anytime. It's uh, of a decreasing level of relevance. <laughs> uh, yeah. I removed the, yeah, maybe. Yeah. Can, maybe I pushed the wrong button. Okay. Yeah, that, that's it. So uh, just to uh, announce that uh, you, you all know the, the, the set plan uh, working group on uh, HVDC and DC technologies. Uh, there is another group, uh, which I'm also coordinating. It's, it's more about industry. Why, why am I talking about industry and energy intensive industries? It's, it's because uh, th there has been a, a study uh, financed by the uh, European Parliament to assess what will be the future needs of uh, energy intensive industries in terms of energy vectors. Uh, so meaning not only electricity, but also hydrogen, 
uh, biomass and so on. And so for the six sectors that you see there, uh, the, those sectors were analyzed what will be their future processes and what will those new processes require in terms of, of energy. Uh, and so we have mapped all those factories across the EU and also map the needs uh, at not three levels. So at not at a country level, but really at small zones level. So that means indeed six sectors, but also 16 products. Uh, and so here, for instance, for steel, what are the, the results in terms of needs for, for electricity, hydrogen, coal, coke, natural gas, uh, and so on uh, at the horizon 2030 and 2050. Uh, and then the result is really a, a mapping that you see there. It's available online on the uh, EIGL, so Energy and Industry Geolab of the GRC, where you, re you really can zoom in the future needs of industry for all those uh, vectors. It is really online uh, and you can play with it. You have all the links there. Last thing I wanted to introduce, but just an announcement. Uh, uh, this group, HVDC and DC Technologies, you know it quite well. Um, but now we are uh, launching, uh, we have been launching uh, for some time now, uh, like starting last year, uh, uh, LVDC subgroup that will look uh, at the, the, yeah, the, the, the development of the DC technologies, but at low voltage level. And uh, they will address uh, why LVDC, what are the benefits, uh, the challenges, and what are the priorities, targets, and proposed activities, just the same way as was done in the implementation plan for HVDC. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, I think I will stop here. You will see there that uh, the, the why DCDC, the, the benefits uh, uh, of DC um, uh, at low voltage. And uh, I will stop here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, are there any urgent questions from the room or do we take them during the panel discussion? Okay, so I suggest we go straight to the panel discussion uh, now. Uh, I would like to introduce uh, Christian Kier, who is a uh, Chief Regulatory Affairs Officer with um, Supernode and also the board chair of current. I would like to also introduce uh, the speakers uh, uh, from earlier to come back up on the stage. Uh, John Fitzgerald, Professor Lee, uh, Dick von, Professor Dick von Hertem. Um, uh, uh, of course, Eric Lico standing behind me, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I did, yes. Uh, and uh, Antje joining uh, remotely, if we could get her uh, 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 on the screen. Can you hear us, Anja? Uh, yes, I can. We don't hear you. But now it should work. Good. We have a sound check. Very good. Very good. Thanks. Thank you, Leila. And uh, as you can see, this panel it has become uh, somewhat technology agnostic. Uh, Owen Hodge, the chief engineer of, of Supernode, uh, is not in this panel, but uh, the chief executive of Supernode is also. If there is any questions to that technology, uh, it is represented. Um, the, the, the IEA came out with a report last year saying we, we need 80 million kilometers of new grid in the world. And they were basically saying before 2040, which is now about 15 years, we need to build a new power system the size of the one existing one we have, which is taking a hundred years to build. So in 15 years and with some of the supply constraints we've heard about today also in terms of the short-term delivery, at least on DC technology, that's quite a uh, uh, challenge. Um, Eric, you were referring to the uh, recommendation from the commission. Uh, they just came out on the 2040 target plan and the recommendation was 90% decarbonization by 2040. It was not a proposal, it was a recommendation. The proposal will come, but it also said that in order to do that, we need to achieve a decarbonized electricity sector in the second half of the 30s. So that's that's sort of the, the, the time scale we have to get carbon out of, of, of the electricity system. Um, 
EU man energy ministers and even prime ministers have been talking about grids now, and it's really on top of the agenda, and it's really good to see. The question is, do we have the right sense of urgency in order to meet this? Uh, the ministers, the energy ministers and the prime ministers met in Ostende in Belgium uh, last year, and they were basically saying, uh, we would like a meshed grid. It's probably easier to say than to do it, and that's what this, uh, this uh, panel is also about. Uh, there was a meeting of energy uh, ministers yesterday, uh, the first formal council under the Belgian presidency. And I, my first question to each member of the panel is going to be from Tina van der Staden, the Belgian energy minister, who yesterday at the formal energy council said the following. It is of paramount importance that the EU power system is able to integrate the vast amounts of variable renewables that will continue to come online in the years ahead. So that's what she said yesterday uh, in front of all the energy ministers following the meeting. So my question to you is, she asked the question, are we going to be able to do that? And I'm going to ask each and every one of you, will we be able to do that? So I'll start, uh, I'll start with you, Eric. Yeah, that, that's quite a, a challenge. And uh, Antje also referred to the National Energy and Climate Plans. Uh, drafted by the, the member states. We don't have them all already, uh, but um, what we have received uh, shows the, the, the plans of, of the member states. And uh, it, it also shows that we have to compared to, to, to what is planned uh, in those national energy and climate plans. So uh, we uh, it's possible to do it, and the, the, the climate target plan made the, the modeling to, to show that this, this is possible, but still it needs even more uh, commitment, even more ambition uh, from, from the member states, uh, and then from the, the all EU. John Fitzgerald, same question. Uh, yeah. Um... Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm not sure. I, I think we, we definitely need to keep trying. Um, it's a challenge. Um, I, on my second slide, I showed a, a maze that we got to work our way through to get to the decarbonized goal. And, and I'd be happier if we missed an interim target by a year or two and got to the ultimate goal uh, eventually. And I think uh, this is about just trying to plan our way and having a, 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 a means to get there. And this is the optimum, global optimum, not a, not a, uh, an interim optimum or a suboptimal or a local optimum. So, um, not I'm not a huge fan of of of, of uh, being up overly obsessive about short term targets. They're really important. We got to try, but I think the long term goal is 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 the ultimate target. We got to keep our our eye, our eye on that. But Dirk, that was you were mentioning. Should it be fifty or sixty? And are we really planning for the period after 2030 now? So in the light of that, uh, will we make it? Um, first of all, I was a little bit worried when you said the Belgian politician has said something and then if it can be anything. This time I actually uh, was not too surprised about uh, this and this is fair. Um, well, I think the question is different. Huh? The renewables will only happen if the grid is there, because otherwise nobody is crazy enough to put lots of wind turbines somewhere in the sea with no, no wire connected to it. So the question is, will the grid uh, stop us from actually doing what we want to do? And what, what I tried to say during my presentation, in, in a way, is also um, because as an engineer, everything is possible. And we go to the moon, so of course we can build some wires. Um, but but you need to follow through with everything and not just saying we're going to do this in 2050. But in order to get there, you need to take a number of decisions. Processes need to be quicker. Uh, the supply chain, we need to find solutions for that. And I guess we need to work together better at the European level. That means cross-border, but also as researchers, probably we need to think about centers of excellence, et cetera. So it has a lot of work to be done. Um, so, but yeah. Professor Lee. Uh, 
hear me, yeah. yeah. Uh, I think I probably, you know, I'm familiar a bit more with the GV, so I probably can, you know, start uh, uh, with GV as, as, as what I understand. Uh, what I see is going back a couple of years ago, lots of talking about net zero offshore wind seems everyone recognized there's a need to build more offshore wind farms, but not much discussion on the transmission infrastructure. But what I do see, you know, gradually people realize, you know, in order to meet uh, the net zero target, in order to connect all the offshore wind farms, we need to significantly reinforce the GB onshore transmission network. Uh, so, so as a question you mentioned, you know, in the next 15 years, we need to double our transmission capacity, yeah, compared to, to, to the, what we have been building in the last 100 years. So what I see is, uh, uh, you know, the policymakers, the, the TSOs, the developers are, are realizing, you know, we need to uh, uh, target or, or significantly reinforce the transmission system. I think that's a good starting point. Uh, so again, as Doug said, as engineer, I think that's doable as long as we have the mentality, have the determination, you know, to, to get this done. Anche, um, nine times more uh, that compares to the last 10 years, uh, you and your TSO colleagues are going to be responsible for that acceleration and keeping the lights on at the same time. Uh, will, we, will we be able to make it? Responsible, we're not responsible, the, the member states are responsible for these targets. We have to facilitate this and we do our utmost uh, to, to reach the targets. As a, but as I said, yes, collaboration is extremely important across all actors. Uh, we see that the Commission does a lot of uh, good new rules and good new um, action plans. But we also see that we have been a bit all together. We have been a bit slow the last 10 years. So, so I had the, the example of um, Northern Seas. We had the same exercise 12 years ago and there were targets. Uh, we, we translated this. And, but actually what has been fulfilled then or what has been built was just 56% of what was the target. So, so we have experienced to be slow. Conditions have improved, but also the targets have um, accelerated they they are plus 120 percent from what has been targeted earlier so it's really really challenges but there's a good vibration in europe so we, we all want that we all do our best to collaborate we should not forget the onshore system also there are a lot of investments are needed and apropos investments the other costs they are huge what i showed was the low cost assumption but in reality, we see actually prices of assets doubling or even tripling. So this increases also the investment challenge. So, so how we can get this done is, is still a big question. But yeah, we try what we can and also count on uh, member states and commission to help you a bit. Thank you. Um, I want to uh, address uh, the people who are looking uh, uh, at this event from outside, uh, there's a Slido code, a Slido code, and you can uh, you can ask questions there. I don't know if we have any any at the moment. Uh, if we have one, it's always difficult in a in a room to get the first question. So maybe we'll we'll hand that over to uh, to the external audience while you guys can think about what your questions will be. Yeah, let me just get this. So there's lots of questions coming in. Um, they generally kind of uh, split between technical questions and maybe uh, policy and coordination. So I'll, I'll start with maybe the policy and high level um, question from Pat Cox. My understanding is that the scale of the investment needs in resin grids to meet net zero is a revolutionary paradigm shift and that the scale of the TYNDP response is more evolutionary in ambition. It seems like a strategic mismatch, I suppose, even if the technology and, uh, is there. Am I wrong? And that's for everyone on the panel. Okay. Uh, Eric, is there a mismatch? Yeah. As I said, I'm from the Research Innovation Unit, so you are asking me questions that go beyond uh, the remit uh, of, of my competencies. So the uh, the, the, the Commission is really putting in place uh, 
all the, the, the framework that, that is possible to, to make this uh, great uh, investment possible. Uh, so notably, the, uh, to, to acknowledging the, the challenge of uh, also those uh, anticipatory uh, investments that are needed in, in the grid uh, to, to, to meet the growing renewables. Uh, uh, also, for instance, on land, if there are some areas where uh, there is a lot of PV potential, but there is not yet any connection. Uh, the chicken and an egg uh, question is, uh, there will be no renewables if there is no grid. There will be no grids if there is no renewable to, to be uh, tapped in. So that's uh, where the, the, the vision at EU level can help to, to, to bring together uh, again uh, the, the, the ambition on one side and, uh, and also the, uh, the, the realization on the ground. Any other comments? Sure. Um, yeah, so I, 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 is there a mismatch? I think the, the sea basin approach is uh, optimizing on a sea basin approach. And what Eric talked about in his presentation about a global holistic view for anticipatory investment. There's a mismatch there because the anticipatory investment for the North Sea may not be the appropriate anticipatory investment when you consider the onshore and all the other sea basins. So you have to look at the whole system, a whole system approach. And that goes back to what the politicians have said. And the president of the commission said, we're, we're stronger together. So you need a, you can't take a piecemeal. If you want to have an optimum um, for cost benefit analysis, you have to look at the whole, the whole situation and not just the local. Yeah, I'd like to follow up on this, and I, I do think there is a mismatch, although that I think the TSOs are really doing a lot, and they're moving as fast as they can under a lot of constraints. Uh, but we're going to go to something which is completely different from what we have today with the framework of that we had in the past. And, and I, I've used the, the example before. If you think about a moonshot, we, everyone uses moonshot. Everyone is doing moonshots all the time. Uh, but if you really think where it comes from, this is Kennedy that said, okay, the Russians beat us to, the, uh, to space. We weren't going to be the first one to be on the moon. And the consequences for that, that the entire industry and the entire society had a primary goal. We we're going to change all the rules that we had, everyone in the same direction, industry aligned. Um, that meant also that some companies were ordered to do things which were maybe not necessarily the true capitalism. Uh, of the US at that point in time, but they all went for it and rules were changed in order to achieve the target. And that under the current constraints, I think we're doing what we can. And I don't think this is what we should do. It's not enough. Okay. Auntie, I don't know if you want to come in here. Otherwise I'll, I'll take another question. All right. Uh, I'm going to ask if there are any questions in the room. Okay, Rob, do you have another one from the uh, from the op? Yeah. Short one. So it's um, I, I I suppose it maybe goes back to there are quite a few technology questions coming in here, but I'll, I'll try and simplify. Um, DC breakers exist today on the global market, and have been implemented in China. Um, in the ONDP, there is references to DC breaker or no DC breaker scenario. Um. So I suppose uh, what is the question is what is the purpose of the no DC breaker scenario if we're talking about an ambitious um, grid development and all those scenarios seem to give better outcomes. So I think maybe that was uh, at least for you, Antje, and okay. perhaps also if if there's a um, from the from the research side a uh, uh, an indication as to where where do we expect DC breakers to be in a future scenario? But Angie first. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, we we did this as uh, so we we assume you know, we investigated twenty forty and twenty fifty, and so then uh, as we know the DC breaker is there, but the point is it's it's let's say commercially not interesting. So and nobody has used it in Europe yet. So there's a huge risk, and um, when something goes wrong, then then um, the TSO has a problem. So, so, so far, TSOs do not really dare to implement it due to this risk. Um, and 
Therefore, we assumed uh, it's there or it's not there. And then there are variants in between. And in uh, the visualization tool, you can also see the variance. So we assumed it's there from 40 or it's not there in 50 even and, and with different variants in between. It comes late or it, uh, it comes partly. So this was just to have a spread of results and also show the impact of, um, of this tool having it or not. Thank you. Any insight on when we can expect DC circuit breakers, when we can assume that they will be uh, available? Okay, I see Personally. something first, maybe. Uh, uh, from my understanding and uh, my knowledge, when talked to various you know, colleagues in industry, you know, uh, I, I, I firmly believe in five years' time, we will have a commercially viable DC circuit breakers coming to the European market. You know. uh, the technology is there, and I guess the challenge is how to reduce the cost, how to reduce the volume or, or you know, the weight of the circuit breaker. Uh, as, as, as commented, you know, obviously the technology has been demonstrated in China, but it was mainly on a sort of, you know, pilot demonstration uh, aspect rather than on a commercial, you know, basis. And uh, what I heard about, you know, uh, uh, back in China, they are doing further development work, and uh, they are going. They are looking at different type of DC circuit breaker compared to what they have tested and installed. But again, you know, from what I heard and uh, my, you know, from from the industry colleagues, seems you know it's coming. And I know some people are not in favor of DC circuit breaker, have some doubts. But I personally firmly believe it's coming. And the technology will come regardless of whether, whether some of us like it or not. Let's say the other professor. Yeah, I, I fully agree that, I mean, the technology is available, but then maybe not yet, let's say, uh, market ready completely. But we will have to take risk uh, because a lot of things that we need to do, if you look at the 2050 picture, are many things we don't do today. And in order to go from where we are today to where we need to be, there will be some more risk taking than, than what we're traditionally used to. And regarding the DC breaker, I don't think we'll have a DC breaker on each line end um, as we kind of have in the AC system, but that doesn't mean zero. So we will have, you know, our studies show that uh, having DC breakers will bring significant benefit to the system. Um, you can do without, but that comes at a cost. So, um, yeah. so we, we expect there will be. Um, John, Eric was talking about uh, common technology requirement uh, as some of the work. How does the superconductors fit into all this? Do you need to change all the technical standards? Are there, is there a lot of work to do on that in order to integrate uh, technology with larger circuits? Um, so there's, there's, there's definitely differences as own highlighted and um, different characteristics and benefits. So I think there, there definitely is integration work to be done and standards development. And we need to write the, the script for 2050. So superconductors can play a role in that a uh, big role. Uh, we think, um, so there's definitely work to be done. Um, and, and back to the, 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 the question about the DC breakers, the chicken and egg and how we do it. We will have to take risks and find clever ways to introduce technologies. And I think there are innovative ways to do it where we can sandbox some of these things, grow the confidence, and then try not repeat it everywhere. So uh, if you do it in, in Germany, it's it's good for the UK and vice versa. Um, and rather than having to go back to square one every time, which is what happens with innovation. If it's, if six TSOs have done something it, it, it and you do it, it's not innovation. It, it's 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 just getting on with it. So I think we, we, we do have a, a work to do, but I'm, I'm confident that we, with the right approach, we can, we can really get some new tech in to help and, and grow the toolbox so that we can deliver the system that people want. So Eric, we, we, um, we have a, grids are very high on the, on the agenda now. We saw Sefcovic initiating a dialogue last week on, on grid infrastructure. We have the grid action plan, we have the set plan. Uh, now you have been involved in, in DC and HVDC long before it became fashionable. Um, how, how, how do we ensure that getting to 
a grid that can actually sustain decarbonization that we that we have the necessary European coordination tools in place or do we already have them and from research innovation viewpoint the the, the set plan working group on, on HVDC is certainly one arena uh, where the the strategy uh, can be agreed uh, across the, the, the member states, uh, but not only the member states, also the associated countries, industry uh, and research. So that's uh, uh, where we can harmonize the, the, the targets. Uh, and so uh, also significant uh, research innovation projects like uh, Interopera uh, have been launched to, to really uh, make sure that the all those systems are, are developed, but they, they are also interoperable, uh, so that we have uh, a grid that will uh, that will work when it's integrated at, at EU level. I open up for another question, Dietrich. Yeah. So Dietrich is the Secretary General of the Europe. Thank you very much, and thanks uh, for current for putting together this uh, this event. Um, I just wanted to pick up on something uh, that I wrote down, and then I heard uh, Dirk kind of mention it uh, almost instantly. Uh, you talked about we have to take risk, uh, and I think uh, we have to do things. Who who is? I think we're what we're looking at when we're talking about the chicken and egg kind of everybody. It's kind of waiting for everyone else to, if, if you want to exaggerate the, the wind developers are waiting for the tso's to, to build the, the grids in a way the tso is maybe saying i need to have the wind plans to have that um, the manufacturers are saying well i mean i'm not going to build a factory unless i have some clear orders or commitments that someone actually will buy it um, so when we're talking about risk and kind of to really get going down this tremendously uh, challenging path that I think Antje explained very, very well in the uh, ONDP presentation. Who is the one, or who are the ones that need to give that impetus into the system? I'd be very curious to see, and how can we, how could we do that? Because I think you were, you were trying to get that, uh, where do we get that sense of urgency? And I think the people here, they all feel the sense of urgency, but at the same time, we feel a bit constrained because there is something missing that uh, holds us back uh, to a greater or lesser extent. What's the something we're missing? I guess that this was kind of directed towards something. I, maybe I'll start. Uh, I don't think risk is necessarily a problem. This is a very normal thing in business. Uh, you just need to be able to hedge that risk against a certain income. Uh, so there is a responsibility. So I think in a way, there should be an opportunity to in to move towards things that we don't know exactly whether they will work or not. That means if it's a regulated investment, that the regulator needs to accept that there might be an additional cost or that we're going to do something where there is a space for an extra cable to be connected, but we're not sure whether the cable is going to be connected in five or 10 years. And the five or 10 years makes a difference and the investment will make a difference in the uh, profitability. If we don't allow for that, then it's going to be difficult. Uh, the same with innovation. If we don't allow for innovation to happen, we will have to do that at the moment that it's too late and it will cost more. So we need to do preemptive investment in innovation, doing the pilots at scale. Again, they're not going to be the most cost of efficient solution then, but the next one should be. So I think there is, uh, as long as um, there is a mechanism that allows you to do that in a fair way with the right stakeholders and, and maybe a, an environment where, which is changing the rules because sometimes you have to do things that are not according to the, the, the way we usually do things. And you need to be permitted to do that. Uh, so a, that's, I think, where we need to focus on to get these things done. Can I, Sleep. Can I add a few more? Uh, I just want to echo what Deck has said. If you look, uh, other parts, some other parts of the world, you know, they are 
testing lots of innovative ideas uh, related to transmission, you know, generation. And exactly as Dex said, because they are not worried about they are going to, you know, lose the investment. They are not, they are going to get, uh, you know, the penalty because of uh, the idea, you know, doesn't work. So uh, in a sense, I think uh, Europe really need to, to have a sort of mechanism which allows OEMs, the TSO, the developers to, to try to test new, you know, innovative ideas without uh, having to worry about uh, get a big penalty or get penalized. I, I guess that's to some extent really pull, you know, push the, the new technology ahead. Yeah. Nobody did a cost benefit analysis of the Zhangbei system because otherwise they wouldn't have built it. So that's the four terminal mesh T secret that they built in China or the, put the breakers there. I mean, of course they calculate how much it would cost, but there were other solutions that were there. So why don't we build a toy system of five, two gigawatt converters and some cables in between? Andy, you just jump in if you have something to, uh, to add. Um... Yeah, I, I see. The, I see. Actually, um, you, you can get a lot for money. So, so risk is money, and um, money is <laughs> the solution, or either the problem and also the solution. And I see uh, usu usually in the European uh, system, we have uh, the Commission being the glue between all the players. And um, my impression is they do see the issues, they do see the problems. They they come uh, with help. They come sometimes also with money. And now it will be interesting because we have these huge ambitions and we will get uh, elections and then usually it takes some time until the new commission is in place, until um, uh, the system is running again and until eventually also the budget is clear. But um, yeah, we're curious how all this works out and so I, I really, <laughs> I'm a fan of the uh, European Commission and what they see and what they do and how they try to link um, us all together because this this makes the European system work as between all the actors. Yeah, thanks. Um, I think it's an excellent question. Who is the royal we? Uh, who's going to do all this? Um, and we all need to change, but not me. And I know so it's, it's it's in that space. I think we should probably look at the drivers and and the big cost out here at large is in 2022. Um, Europe probably imported about the guts of a trillion euros of fossil fuels. So in this renewable energy future with all the expensive transmission systems, there's free fuel. So that's good news. And I think we need to just grab that and have a vision. Uh, I think the, there is a mismatch between the ask of the politicians with the big targets and then the, 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 phone, the phone call to say, why, why, why aren't my lights on? And the fear of getting that phone call. So there is a mismatch, and I think the system is delivering as best it can with the tools and the training that we collectively have, and we're all part of that system. And now we see a need for something entirely different. And uh, I think the some of the TSOs and the politicians need to have a, a, an honest conversation about the mismatch between expectation and what can be delivered, because I do think there's a bit of phonyism going on about, no, you have your targets and we're going to plan towards them. I think the ONDP is the first sign of something coming out. And in two years time, when it connects up with the, with the onshore, we learn more. But I think there's an honest conversation to recognize the gap, uh, the mismatch, as someone called it. Uh, and they could do well to, to maybe do a, a joint trip to, to see Zhang Bai and, and what's possible. Because I do think if we stick with the old toolbox, we've no chance. Question here. Uh, I'll get you. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, sort of new question, but probably just, uh, introduce to... yourself, please. Oh, okay. Uh, my name is Oscar. I'm a PhD student from Kimberley under deep supervision. Uh, um, I have a new question, but it's a bit related to what what's been discussed previously. Um, my main question is that how, how should we do this in a more coordinated manner? Because uh, having also uh, read the offshore network development plans, for example, trying to take a look at the North Sea Basin development, it seems that there are a lot of things that need to be done, but also it goes beyond 
let's say the market models, the economy aspects of it. There are a lot of aspects that we can take, for example, if we choose to uh, develop a uh, mass offshore grid, there's a res really resilience asset, aspects, redundancy aspects, and also there will be upcoming challenges, for example, how we can operate that. Uh, and how, how should we do this? We have enough entities to do that because it seems that in the study itself, we collect inputs from TSOs, right? But they sort of work for themselves. Okay, we built 22 gigawatts, but I don't know, it's just for us, not thinking beyond that. And then there are also, of course, multi-bilateral um, uh, corporations between TSO, but I think it, it should be done in a more coordinated manner. Uh, can and so we, for example, use one of their mandates to do this? Do we need a new regional coordination center for that? I don't know what's the answer, but I'm just wondering, do we need someone to do these tasks uh, go, going beyond uh, market modeling, economy modeling? Because of course, there are a lot of challenges coming from, from this plan. So it's in the same category of uh, what you also mentioned, Anshi, I think you said in your presentation that DC grids need joint control or more joined up control. Is, is, is the model working from a, from a governance perspective? Uh, actually, we, we do collaborate for since 2008 between the TSOs and in the planning, as in the planning division, we have uh, uh, six regions. And uh, so we are used to collaborate on the uh, European system in planning and operation and market uh, question and on everything. And also we collaborate on this ONDP, of course. Um, and even in the Northern Seas, you mentioned the Northern Seas, also the member state, they do have a forum that's called the 10E um, offshore corridors, which are also um, a consequence, not only of the 10E regulation, but they, they had this also before. So even the member states, they have also groups. Uh, a good group in the Northern Seas is, for example, looking at maritime spatial planning. So they do already, the member states have a group uh, looking how, how they can share uh, or, or best use the sea basin, which is really helping for the um, offshore planning as well, so that it's done together. And then we TSO, we do it together and look at what can be done. And we also have uh, member states signing MOUs, TSO signing MOUs on joint projects already. Um, looking at concrete projects and uh, going beyond that with these Ost and then Esberg and whatever declarations that are especially in the northern um, northern seas and also Baltic seas. So there's a lot of collaboration ongoing already. Of course, there's always more needed, but but that's a very good start. And it started also quite some time ago. So it's not new. We know each other. Um, we know the routines and, and we uh, can optimize to get also this done. So it's it's not TSOs working for themselves and for the countries. We have for more than now for nearly 20 years, we have routines and working together. And we have another, another question down here from uh, Kiet Palmas. So uh, Leila, how much time do we have? Okay, it's been the last be question very, and then I have a brief. Um, I think everybody recognizes that European Commission has an important play, a role to play, and um, I'm happy to see that the, they're not um, very polarized contradictions between all the presentations. Everybody respects each other in different technological views and, and concepts, but at the end, um, everybody agrees that we have to take risks, and that has to be a, a blunt, strong move to get to 2050, to what do we want to reach? And I have a very simple question because we don't have much time. Thank you. Um, there are four people in the panel and I have one question to the four people. Five, five. My, my apologies, <laughs> one digital. Uh, we have elections and that can be a pivotal point in decision-making uh, in Europe. If, you, if we look to two years ago, Nobody would think that we would have a strong investment in defense on European level. That's really impressive how things can change in six to 12 months. Assume you become vice president of the European Commission after the elections, the five of you. What would you do as bold movements to get 
the grids ready for 2050. Thank you. I think we can make them presidents, no? All right, so if we start here, Vice, Pre Vice President Lecon. Yeah, well, I think that, um, uh, yeah, I've become grandfather two years ago, uh, and I realized that my granddaughter uh, will be 28 in 2050 and 78 in 2100. Uh, and so uh, if, if I were the, the, the future president, uh, I would really uh, push for the, the, the global uh, target, uh, well, to, to, to push the, the whole planet uh, for, for going to, to lower emissions, to, to secure a good future for our children and grandchildren. And uh, it means making uh, a lot of efforts inside the EU to, to, to lead uh, the, the, the world, because uh, the EU has been leading into the, the fight against uh, climate change. Uh, uh, at the same time, we have to remain uh, a continent that is to be looked at as a, a good example to follow, meaning that uh, while uh, going to uh, the, the, the decreasing of, of emissions, we have to show that this can be done uh, while maintaining prosperity, while keeping our industry uh, inside the, the EU, so that the uh, example of, of EU would be one that the, the rest of the world would want to follow, uh, rather than saying, oh, they are going too fast and we don't want to, to go that fast. So uh, definitely also for, for EU, uh, we are in a very special case where we, uh, as was said, we import uh, a lot of energy. Uh, each day there is one billion uh, approximately, it changes of course uh, every day, every year, uh, that is uh, spent uh, on importing uh, energy. Uh, so for, for us, really, uh, going to, to renewables, to, to have uh, uh, renewables and, and low carbon generation uh, inside the EU is really also preserving uh, our prosperity to, to secure uh, energy, not only electricity, but also uh, other uh, clean energy vectors like uh, hydrogen uh, available for our consumers, uh, both uh, households, but also industry. Uh, with uh, industrial uh, electrification or switching to, to, to hydrogen fuel. So really uh, uh, finding the, 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 the good compromise uh, to go as quickly as possible, uh, but also maintaining uh, our competitiveness at global level. Very good. I'm going to hand over to Vice President Ports first. Briefly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I would fill uh, the budget with money for infrastructure because uh, that would save a lot of time in discussing who pays what, uh, which we can expect now that uh, the production is moved to the margins of Europe and so a lot of uh, infrastructure will be needed to transport it. So I would fill that, so which would accelerate the process because then just the sharing mechanism would be have to be invented. So money for infrastructure. Thank you, Vice President Fitzgerald. Okay, well, firstly, I'd have a little celebration. Um, <laughs> um, but seriously, the things I would do um, with renewables, at the moment, renewables are going through a tough time. Um, so I'd make sure that it was as healthy an investment as oil could be, so that the renewable industry could thrive. Um, secondly, um, I put a lot more money, uh, like Angie, into... Uh, infrastructure and the competence for for that I would seek for that to be centralized so we could have uh, an optimum optimorum rather than a suboptimal loads of grids that are low that are nationally based predominantly so I would probably introduce and she won't like this an independent system operator to identify where anticipatory investment is required and the technological gaps and to to work with the TSOs so that would be that would be number two, and then on supply chain, I would ensure through the, the Net Zero Innovation Act 
and other other everything every other tool that we got the supply chain we need to build out these grids. Vice President Van Hatten. Um, as a good politician, I will steal some ideas. Um, I like the idea of putting money for in, in the infrastructure, uh, but I, I also think what is very urgent is that we work on a master plan for European energy sector 2050. We know where we want to go. So what would we need in such a system? And then with such a master plan, and I mentioned 50 gigawatt between Antwerp and Korea, maybe it's 100 gigawatt we can start building something because at this moment it's piece wise investments and that's not going to do vice president big show since i come from uk so first thing i need to do is to find <laughs> find a job i <laughs> 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 that would be an achievement <laughs> right okay anyway so as an electrical engineer with uh, you know key interest in technology, what I would like to see is to put some money around on the table and uh, you know the uh, the developer for the wind farm for for the you know the HVDC and the utilities can play with it in in a sense a bit like in in, in China you know. So, so you can build something and you can test without worry, worried about, you know, all the financial implications cost. Yeah, so that's from my side. Very good. Thank you all the uh, vice presidents and thanks to the panel. I think we should just give them a round of applause. Mm -hmm. I'll just hand over the closing to uh, Leila Sawyer, Secretary General of the Current. Yeah, so thanks, Christian. Thanks to all the panelists. Uh, I think uh, not much left to say at, at, at this point. Uh, we're uh, looking forward to the white paper. And I think this is uh, just the beginning of the discussion. Uh, we need to discuss this still uh, uh, much further. Uh, any technical questions that we didn't get to, um, please send us an email and we'll still be happy to, uh, uh, to have those conversations uh, bilaterally. Um, but for now, I want to thank everyone, also the people online, for uh, for sticking with us. And now we have a, a lunch uh, in the hall in the foyer. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>